yang terhormat Kepala Direktur Riset dan Pengembangan Pak Dede Johana PhD dan selaku moderator Bu Astari Duranti MN PhD dan to Dr. Nixin as the Project Specialist for Thermofisher Scientific. Selamat datang dan selamat pagi kepada Bapak dan Ibu sekalian dalam webinar Stem sesi 5 ini yang bertemakan STEM Analysis for Life Sciences yang dilaksanakan oleh Direktur Direktorat Riset dan Pengembangan Universitas Indonesia. Saya Alfredo sebagai MC Anda untuk hari ini. Sebelum kita memulai webinar Stem sesi 5 pada hari ini, saya akan membacakan tata tertib peserta terlebih dahulu. Baik, berikut tata tertib untuk webinar pada hari ini. Pada Bapak dan Ibu sekalian untuk mohon menggunakan mode audio Anda, Bapak dan Ibu sekalian dalam keadaan nonaktif untuk kecuali bagi pembicara dan moderator serta nanti tolong mengaktifkan kamera video saat sesi foto nanti. Yang kedua, silakan Bapak dan Ibu mengganti nama profil Zoom dengan format nama underscore instansi, seperti contoh Rani underscore UI. Lalu berikutnya, mohon untuk memasang virtual background yang sudah kami kirimkan melalui email. Yang keempat, bagi peserta yang tidak dapat mengakses Zoom, Anda dapat menjoin melalui kanal YouTube webinar Bang pada bit.live/webinarisbangui. Lalu, peserta yang tidak peserta bisa menuliskan pertanyaan nanti pada sesi tanya jawab pada kolom chat Zoom maupun chat YouTube bagi yang bagi yang bergabung dengan kami melalui YouTube. Lalu berikutnya dimohon untuk tidak mengirimkan chat di kolom Zoom selain dari pertanyaan kepada pembicara karena akan menuliskan rekapitulasi pertanyaan. Lalu berikutnya tautan absen dan feedback webinar akan kami infokan melalui ruang chat. Dan berikut kami sampaikan informasi tambahan. Apabila berkenan, Bapak dan Ibu sekalian dapat memfollow akun Instagram Bismamui, yaitu at Bismamui, untuk mengetahui informasi mengenai kegiatan yang diselenggarakan oleh Direktorat Riset dan Pengembangan UI. Selain itu juga, peserta juga dapat mensubscribe YouTube kami di Direktorat Riset dan Pengembangan UI, untuk mendapatkan notifikasi siaran langsung kegiatan webinar yang diselenggarakan oleh Direktorat Riset dan Pengembangan Universitas Indonesia. Lalu untuk kegiatan rekaman-rekaman sebelumnya, rekaman kegiatan webinar yang telah kami selenggarakan, dapat disaksikan kembali juga pada kanal bit.live.webinaris.bangi. Dan berikut kami sampaikan juga bahwa informasi mengenai pengujian TEM dan alat lain yang kami miliki di Integrated Laboratory and Research Center atau ILRCUI, dapat diketahui dengan mengakses laman http.ac.id ataupun pada scholar.ui.ac.id. Berikut kami persilakan kepada Direktur Riset dan Pengembangan Universitas Indonesia, Pak Dede Juhana PhD, kami persilakan untuk menyampaikan kata sambutan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua, salam sehat semua. Saya ucapkan terima kasih kepada panitia, kemudian juga saya ucapkan terima kasih kepada pihak MTI, ya, terutama kepada narasumber Dr. Rija Iskandar. Ini adalah apa namanya webinar series yang kelima ya, dan juga thank you very much Dr. Nisin. Oke, okay, welcome to our webinar. Oke, okay. dan juga terima kasih uh, saya ucapkan kepada moderator Bu Dr. Astari. Ya, uh, mudah-mudahan uh, kegiatan ini uh, dapat apa namanya berjalan lancar. Ya, jadi di series uh, tem yang kelima ini uh, tetap uh, kita melanjutkan dari tema yang sebelumnya terkait uh, tem analisis in life science. Ya, karena ini juga merupakan hal yang penting. Ya. Uh, salah satu apa namanya uh, permintaan ya uh, feedback kemarin ya uh, terhadap kegiatan kita yaitu uh, adalah uh, kita coba fokus di dua uh, series ini ya terkait dengan life science uh, karena ini beberapa permintaan dan juga di UI juga uh, apa namanya uh, pengukuran pengukuran terhadap life science ini memang uh, mulai meningkat gitu ya jadi artinya 
selanjutnya mudah-mudahan ini juga bisa memberikan apa namanya pada Bapak Ibu yang mungkin nanti apa namanya yang terkait dengan sampel-sampel lab science ya ini bisa memberikan gambaran ya jadi artinya nanti dari Dokter Nisin juga ada beberapa animasi bagaimana menyiapkan di mikrotom gitu ya kemudian juga nanti Bu Astari akan menjelaskan secara apa nasutamsinya dan juga ada Pak Rija yang sudah expert ya dari termopiser yang terkait dengan tem ya terima kasih ya tetap apa namanya membantu kami ya sampai nanti tem series ke-9 atau 10 gitu ya mudah-mudahan dia sampai Desember ya kita akan terus komitmen dengan UI dengan MTI ya untuk menyelenggarakan webinar tem ini nah sebagai informasi lab Tem kita juga ini sedang proses ISO, mohon dukungan dan doanya ya dari Bapak Ibu ya mudah-mudahan ini bisa uh, segera kita enhance ke lebih apa uh, lebih advance gitu ya dari mulai dari uh, pelayanan dan sebagainya ya karena uh, untuk ISO juga memang tidak mudah gitu dan juga saya ucapkan terima kasih kepada MTI dan CMM ya yang kemudian juga dari Pythagoras ya yang membantu kami dalam proses uh, apa namanya proses-proses proses borang-borang dari kegiatan isu ya jadi eh, alhamdulillah jadi di delap kita memang eh, apa namanya ada NMR ada apa namanya ada eh, apa namanya particle size analyzer FTR dan banyak lagi ya eh, nanti eh, kita juga akan membuka eh, beberapa hal eh, webinar-webinar dengan alat-alat yang lain ya eh, terutama yang terkait dengan spektroskopi seperti itu ya demikian pembukaan apa namanya kegiatan webinar seri STEM yang kelima dari saya semoga acara ini bisa berjalan lancar dan Bapak Ibu tetap stay and on ya di apa namanya di kegiatan ini karena juga nanti beberapa apa namanya panitia juga akan memberikan door prize atau hadiah ya yang menurut saya ya lumayan untuk sebagai motivasi kegiatan ini oke itu dari saya saya cukup wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Silakan Mas Alfredo untuk lanjutkan. Waalaikumsalam. Terima kasih Pak Dede untuk sambutannya. Ya. Dan sekarang pada Bapak dan Ibu sekalian kami persilakan untuk menyalakan kameranya karena kita akan memulai sesi, sesi foto pada hari ini. Silakan dinyalakan dulu kameranya terlebih dulu Bapak dan Ibu. Baik. Oke. Siap. Oke. Kita foto siap. Tiga, dua, satu. Oke. Halaman berikutnya. Ya, tiga, dua, satu. Oke. Lalu berikutnya. Ya, tiga, dua, satu. Oke. Terakhir, tiga, dua, satu. Oke, baik. Sudah selesai sesi fotonya, Bapak dan Ibu sekalian. Berikutnya saya akan memperkenalkan kembali profil moderator kita untuk sesi lima hari ini. Baik, untuk moderator kita pada sesi lima untuk hari ini, yaitu Bu Astari Dwiranti, Master of Engineering, PhD. Beliau berasal dari Departemen Biologi, Fakultas Matematika, dan Ilmu Pengetahuan Alam, Universitas Indonesia. Berikut riwayat pendidikan beliau, beliau menempuh S1 di Institut Teknologi Bandung, SSI, lalu berikutnya untuk menempuh pendidikan di Osaka University Jepang, di Master of Engineering-nya sebagian bioteknologi, dan juga menempuh pendidikan PhD-nya di Universitas yang sama, yaitu Osaka University, di bidang bioteknologi juga. Untuk sekarang, beliau sempat bekerja sebagai, masih bekerja sebagai dosen Departemen Biologi, Esmi PAUI, dan sampai sekarang juga masih menjabat sebagai steering committee Asia Pacific Colossum Colloquium. Baik, kepada Bu Moderator kita untuk hari ini, waktu dan tempat kami persilakan. Terima kasih, Mas Edo. Suara saya sudah terdengar belum? Sudah, Bu. Sudah terdengar. Ya, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi, Bapak-Ibu yang saya hormati. Yang terhormat Bapak Direktur Riset dan Pengembang UI, Pak Dr. Dede Johana, ada Mbak Nurina juga di sini. Rekan-rekan dari MTI, Dr. Nisir, as our speaker, welcome. And thank you for taking uh, your time of your schedule for today's webinar. 
juga Bapak Ibu yang saya lihat di sini ada yang dari Makassar, ada yang dari Riau, luar biasa. Terima kasih uh, sudah uh, meluangkan waktu untuk bisa hadir pada webinar hari ini dan mungkin Bapak Ibu yang uh, mengikuti webinar webinar sebelumnya ini sudah seri kelima dan uh, ini sesi kedua untuk uh, live science ya. Uh, sebelumnya uh, bulan lalu kita mengadakan time webinar yang keempat terkait dengan uh, Sampel preparation untuk preparasi sampel biologi. Nah, hari ini kita akan membahas lebih jauh lagi bagaimana uh, tem ini bisa bermanfaat untuk sampel biologi tersebut. Kemudian apa saja yang uh, sudah diindikasikan. Gitu ya. Nah, uh, untuk hari ini kita sesi sebelum masuk ke sesi materi akan ada review terlebih dahulu dari materi uh, tem sebelumnya yang akan disampaikan oleh Bapak uh, Dr. Riza. Pak Riza Eskandar uh, sudah siap ya Pak ya? Karena sebelumnya Bapak Ibu mungkin uh, yang mengikuti ya pada tem Ada beberapa pertanyaan, sangat antusias sekali peserta sehingga masih uh, ada beberapa pertanyaan terkait tem biologi ini yang belum terjawab. Oleh karena itu sebelum kita masuk ke materi akan dibahas terlebih dahulu uh, beberapa pertanyaan tersebut ya sekaligus mengambil dulu apa yang sudah kita pelajari pada uh, webinar sebelumnya. Uh, saya persilahkan Pak Riza. Halo Pak Riza. Belum ada Pak Riza. Nah, sambil menunggu Bapak Ibu uh, diinformasikan bahwa selama presentasi nanti apabila ada pertanyaan uh, silahkan langsung saja dituliskan di kolom chat ya. Tadi sudah disampaikan oleh Mas Edo. Mohon chatnya dituliskan pertanyaan-pertanyaannya. Kemudian nanti juga akan ada sesi quiz ya seperti yang tadi disampaikan. Uh, hadiahnya menarik, <laughs> jadi semoga Bapak Ibu tetap semangat sampai nanti akhir acara dan akan dipilih uh, tiga orang pemenang untuk proyek tersebut. Oke okay, Pak Riza, apakah sudah ada Pak? Nah Pak Riza, nah, Pak. masih mute, mute. Oh, belum bisa bicara. Mau di ke dokter sini dulu? Oke okay, baik terima kasih. Okay. Ya, saya tidak bisa tidak bisa unmute tadi saya nggak tahu kenapa dan juga oh. tidak bisa chatting makanya saya nggak bisa ngapain tadi. <laughs> baik uh, uh, saya izin share screen dari saya aja Bu uh, Astari ya. Ya yes, silakan Pak. Ya sudah terlihat. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi Bapak Ibu sekalian. Ya, saya langsung saja karena memang ada beberapa pertanyaan yang belum terjawab pada sesi webinar sebelumnya dan saya ada waktu sekitar mungkin 5 sampai 10 menit. Izinkan saya untuk membahas pertanyaan-pertanyaan yang belum bisa terjawab kemarin. Saya tidak tahu apakah penanya itu masih hadir pada webinar kali ini karena pertanyaan ini sebetulnya mayoritas terkait dengan material science. Tapi saya pun tidak mungkin nanti panitia bisa menyampaikan jawaban saya via email ataupun secara langsung kepada penanya. Baik, ada enam pertanyaan yang harus dijawab. Pertanyaan pertama itu bisa ditanyakan oleh Karlina dari FTUI. Suara saya jelas ya Bu ya? Jelas, Pak. Jadi pertanyaan pertama itu, Ibu Karina ini dia memiliki sampel aluminium alloy yang direinforce dengan menggunakan nanopartikel silikon oxide. Lalu beliau ingin melihat apakah nanopartikel ini menutupi crack dari plat aluminiumnya. Nah, setelah mendiskusikan dengan pihak TEM di UI, dikatakan bahwa preparasi secara konvensional itu tidak bisa dilakukan karena ditakutkan nanti permukaan eh, nanopartikel yang ada di permukaan itu akan hilang. Eh, betul jawaban dari eh, pihak UI itu benar, karena memang kalau kita hanya langsung melakukan preparasi secara konvensional, maka seandainya memang nanopartikel itu ada di permukaan, maka itu nanti akan tergerus. Tetapi sebetulnya kita bisa memodifikasi teknik dari eh, konvensional preparasi secara konvensional tadi, yaitu dengan menggunakan, saya bikin sedikit sketsa, mohon maaf kalau gambar terang bagus ya, karena ini baru saya bikin tadi pagi. Jadi kita mencoba 
memodifikasi proses konvensional preparasi tadi yaitu dengan cara misalkan kita punya tadi sampelnya itu dalam ukuran 3 cm ya 1 kali 3 cm dalam bentuk plat maka nanti yang kita lakukan adalah kita akan potong sampel tersebut dengan ukuran mungkin lebar sekitar 2 mm lalu sudah itu dengan ketebalan kurang lebih setengah mm dan untuk mendapatkan ketebalan sekitar setengah mm itu, kita harus mengamplas atau mempolisnya. Tapi perlu diperhatikan, karena tadi niatannya kita ingin menganalisa partikel yang ada di permukaan dari alloy tadi, maka yang kita kita polis hanya dalam satu sisi saja. Kemudian nanti setelah kita selesai polis, maka kita akan gabungkan dua, dua plat yang sudah kita potong kecil tadi ya menjadi satu, seperti gambar yang sebelah kanan ini. Dan kemudian nanti dua plat yang sudah digabungkan di, di tadi itu kita masukkan ke media khusus ya media khusus terbuat dari keramik biasanya bentuknya kayak tabung nanti eh, eh, tabung tersebut kita kembali potong kecil kecil ya dengan ketebalan sekitar setengah milimeter tadi dan kemudian dilakukan preparasi konvensional seperti yang sudah saya bahas kemarin nah teknik ini sebetulnya teknik cukup lama dari tahun sekitar 80-an saya saya ada papernya kebetulan dan kebetulan teknik ini memang dimodifikasi oleh profesor saya cuman masalahnya hari ini saya nggak bisa menemukan kalau nanti eh, ibu apa eh, bu Karlina memang tertarik untuk lebih mengetahui lebih jauh terkait dengan teknik ini maka bisa segera menghubungi saya langsung dan nanti akan saya, saya share papernya Nah, tetapi tetap pada akhirnya kalau kalau saya ditanya, saya lebih prefer kalau dengan sampel model seperti ini langsung menggunakan fokus ion beam. Ya, dan fokus ion beam itu setahu saya di Indonesia ada dua saat ini yaitu di pusat penelitian fisika BRIN dan yang satu lagi ada di ITB. Mungkin Ibu Karlina bisa mencoba menghubungi kedua institusi tersebut. Tapi kalau Ibu Karina adalah merupakan mahasiswi, saya sih sangat menyarankan sebetulnya sebagai bagian untuk memahami bagaimana proses teknik preparasi itu berjalan, ya, berlangsung, untuk mencoba melakukan preparasi secara konvensional tadi. Memang akan memakan banyak waktu, tetapi uh, efeknya akan akan baik untuk pemahaman teknik uh, preparasi secara umum. Lalu pertanyaan yang kedua uh, dari Bu Yuliani Herbani, uh, beliau mengatakan kalau misal kita ingin preparasi sampel dari powder, uh, karena biasanya time grade itu dia bersifat hidrofobik, maka kalau dia melakukan pengiringan secara cepat, apakah akan tidak memberikan efek yang disebut sebagai coffee ring? Um, berdasarkan pengalaman saya selama ini, uh, memang coffee ring itu bisa saja terjadi, tetapi karena kita bicara ukuran partikel sangat kecil, itu sebetulnya masalah utama di sini adalah terkait dengan hidrofobiknya, bukan terkait dengan efek dari coffee ringnya. Artinya selama memang kita bisa memastikan bahwa permukaan dari sampel kita itu hilang, efek apa kondisi yang bisa menyebabkan hidrofobik, maka efek coffee ring itu bisa kita minimalisir secara maksimal. Itu caranya bisa kita plasma, kita bersihkan sebelumnya. Justru kalau misalnya kita lakukan pengeringannya lambat, dalam waktu mungkin dalam satu hari satu malam maka kalau memang dia menggunakan solusinya base water base solution itu akan menghasilkan partikel-partikel yang akan teraglomerasi itu malah menyebabkan permasalahan yang lain jadi intinya yang lebih penting adalah kita mencoba menghilangkan sifat dari hidrofobik dari permukaan dari temperatur kita miliki pertanyaan berikutnya yang ketiga kalau misalnya saya punya zirconium keramik ini pertanyaan dari para Ahmad Eka Perpasinya bagaimana? Karena dia sangat rapuh dan mudah pecah. Betul, keramik itu masih hati-hati. Tapi secara konvensional teknik tetap sama. Artinya hanya kita harus memiliki ekstra eh, kehati-hatian dalam memperasinya. Tetapi prinsipnya tetap sama. Prosesnya tetap sama secara konvensional. Atau kalau mau yang lebih mudah, ya tadi seperti saya katakan, menggunakan fokus ion beam. Berikutnya dari Ibu Rismawati Rashid. Kalau misalnya saya ingin menganalisa katalis yang terdiri dari logam transisi dan logam, logam alkali, kira-kira informasi apa saja yang bisa saya dapatkan dengan analisa fit? Jadi Ibu Rismawati, fokus ion beam itu sebetulnya teknik ataupun alat untuk preparasi sampel, bukan untuk menganalisa sampel. Ya, memang kita bisa menambahkan dengan IDX sehingga kita bisa tahu secara pasti bagian mana yang berisi unsur yang apa yang ingin kita preparasi di sana. Tetapi mungkin pertanyaan yang lebih tepat adalah kira-kira apa yang mesti saya perhatikan ketika saya memperhasi sampel yaitu dari logam transisi dan logam akali. 
kita tahu dua logam ini memiliki properties yang berbeda. Salah satu saja yang paling utama logam akal itu sangat reaktif, lebih reaktif dibandingkan transisi. Ya, maka memang ketika paper sample itu butuh kehati-hatian. Jadi menggunakan high tension yang standar, yang yang middle, ya itu untuk mem- mem- mengantisipasi uh, permasalahan yang akan muncul. Ya. Nah, untuk detailnya, sekali lagi kalau memang Ibu Risma Mati ingin uh, lebih tahu lebih jauh, bisa menghubungi saya via email. Ya. Tapi pada prinsipnya, uh, kalau kita memiliki sampel yang memiliki properti yang berbeda, logam transisi biasanya dia lebih keras dibanding logam akali, maka memang kita membutuhkan uh, beberapa step yang perlu kita perhatikan dalam preparasi sampel menggunakan fokus AMD. Pertanyaan berikutnya dari Bu Riani Widiarti, bagaimana cara mekanisme lamela dapat melekat pada jarum atau pada grid? Pada prinsipnya, dia menggunakan proses yang paling sederhana disebut dengan soldering, ya, proses mensolder seperti biasa. Ya. Nah, itu kita... Uh, di sini ada gambar yang saya lagi juga kurang baik, mohon maaf ya. Jadi kalau misal saya punya uh, lamela yang sebelum diangkat dari sampel bulk, itu biasanya nanti kita sentuhkan needle kita ke salah satu bagian dari lamela tersebut dan kita solder menggunakan material-material yang biasanya sudah kita gunakan juga untuk protection layer. Lalu kita angkat keluar ya, kita angkat ke atas, lalu kita lakukan cara yang sama dengan menggunakan soldering tadi untuk menempelkan ke template Nah, hanya saja proses yang kedua tadi itu untuk fokus ion beam generasi lama itu dilakukan secara manual. Jadi kita mesti hati-hati. Jangan sampai proses kita menarik dan menempelkan itu bisa menancur, melakukan keburukan dan bisa mematahkan lamel yang kita miliki. Tetapi dengan fokus ion beam yang modern, saat ini semua itu dilakukan dengan otomatis. Jadi meminimalisir hal-hal yang tidak kita inginkan. Pertanyaan terakhir, Uh, ini sangat-sangat uh, uh, apa ya praktikal pertanyaannya. Um, jadi dari Bu Fatisha, beliau mengpreparasi sampel enamel gigi ya bahan yang memiliki enamel gigi dengan menggunakan fokus ion beam. Dan setelah um, dideposisi dengan karbon lalu dimiling atas bawah itu uh, apa namanya ketika mau melakukan analisa lebih lanjut atau preparasi lebih lanjut sampel itu selalu bergeser penyebabnya apa itu penyebabnya adalah karena sampel e, bu Fatisa masih memiliki sifat non konduktif yang sangat tinggi kita tahu bahwa enamel gigi itu pada prinsipnya dia adalah non konduktif untuk suhu temperatur e, e, ruangan ya nah jadi salah satu cara solusinya bagaimana kita harus buat sampel tersebut memiliki sifat konduktif yang lebih baik biasa kita coating dengan gold. Ya, seandainya memang features dari permukaan tidak terlalu penting, mungkin kita bisa coating dengan gold. Atau pada saat kita letakkan pada sample holder, itu kita harapkan atau kita usahakan menggunakan conductive tape. Ya. Tapi pada prinsipnya, pergeseran yang kita lihat selama proses preparasi dengan fokus ion beam itu disebabkan oleh karena sample tersebut masih bersifat non-conductive. Maka kita harus tingkatkan sifat dari konduktivitas. Hmm. Baik, eh, itu saja Bapak Ibu ya, enam pertanyaan yang belum terbahas kemarin. Apabila ada pertanyaan tambahan atau penjelasan yang kurang jelas, eh, bisa dipertanyakan langsung kepada saya dengan mengirim kepada mengirimkan email dengan ya, alamat email saya tulis di sini ya. Dan insya Allah nanti akan saya eh, coba bahas eh, mampu saya. Itu aja Bu Asari, saya kembalikan kepada Bu Asari. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih banyak Pak Riza atas penjelasannya sangat detail sekali ya. Tadi 6 PR, 6 pertanyaan yang sebelumnya disampaikan oleh peserta pada webinar keempat. Barusan sudah dijawab dengan baik oleh Pak Riza dan Pak Riza juga membuka. Silakan bagi yang mau bertanya lebih jauh gitu ya ada emailnya. 24 jam ya Pak ya? <laughs> Oke, terima kasih Pak Riza. Baik Bapak Ibu, sekarang kita masuk ke sesi utamanya untuk webinarnya. Um, allow me to introduce our honorable speaker, Dr. Nisim, who will deliver his talk today in title 3 dem for Life Sciences. Um, uh, Nurina, boleh ditunjukkan CV-nya? Okay. Dr. Nisim, uh, he received his bachelor degree in biological science from Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, and his PhD in epigenetics and molecular cell biology from National University of Singapore. Uh, beliau juga menjadi product specialist dari Thermal Research Scientific, uh, research scientist di NUS, dan juga uh, di Temasek Laboratory 
Library dengan topik Invisible Formatting Organization with Vibrant Kayo Liang and Molecular Approaches. Uh, demikian untuk CV pembicara kita hari ini. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand the time over to Dr. Sin. Dr. Sin, are you ready? Yes, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Astari. And very good morning, everyone. So it's a great honor for me to have this opportunity to talk to the uh, uh, talk to you about how we can use EM in life science. So now let me share with you my screen. Okay, so Dr. Astari, are you able to see my screen over there? Yeah, it's clear. Can you just uh, make it full screen? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, everyone. Yes. And first of all, uh, we are coming from uh, Thermo Fisher together with me, Dr. Riza. So the mission of the company is to enable our customer to make the world a healthier, cleaner, and a safer place. So we contribute a lot, especially in this uh, COVID uh, pandemic situations, including all the detections, protections, and all the research we contribute to the to fight against this virus. So, uh, so in today's my talk is actually focusing on uh, all the aspects in life science. So in this uh, graph, uh, we demonstrate the life is complex. This including from the minimum unit in life, we got the, the coding of the gene DNA sequencing to all the way to human bodies. So we are not simply visualizing individuals, but we are visualizing a very complex system, including the, the coding of the genome, the structure of each of the proteins, then coming to a bigger scale, including all the function of different cells, how the protein function inside the cell, and how the cell talking to another cell, we call the cell cell communications. Then in, into a much larger scale, then we come to the tissues and organs, like the muscles, kidneys, and lungs. So all these complex coming together, forming human bodies. So to understand life, we understand each step uh, at different scales. So including different technologies, which I will introduce you today, like gene uh, single particles, which understand the protein structure, tomography to understand how the protein functions inside the cell and what happens inside the cell. And also I'd like to share with you some insight about the large volume analysis is how we can understand as the tissue and organ level as the, for life science. So first uh, I'd like to share with you on these different skills of imaging. Then I believe all of you are very familiar with different light microscope, the stereoscopy and the like confocals and uh, fluorescence microscope. So to look at things at different scales, we need different imaging capabilities. Like with the stereo microscope or even with uh, human eyes, we can see clearly the, the clusters of the, these different bacteria and fungus inside the petri dish. By then they using the simple light microscope, like the bright field microscope, then we can see the cell cultures and some of the histogram uh, of, the, of the sections. If we then be looking something even smaller using the confocal and the fluorescence microscope, then we can see what happens inside the cell. You can see this beautiful graph about the nucleus, then some of the like, tubulin structures and also cell membranes. But if we want to see something even smaller, so we need the help of the electron microscope. So including both the SEM, which gives you all the morphology and the surface information, you can see some of the bacteria and some fungus or maybe the, uh, the surface information. Then using the transmission or electron microscope called PEM, you can see what happens inside the cell. For example, all these sections, you can see the uh, cellular section of the cell, and you can see different organelles and mitochondria, some vesicles inside cellular bodies. Then if we see something even smaller, like the virus particles and of the protein micro complex, then we use additional technologies. Like for example, one of these examples we talked in the previous session about negative staining, and in this topic, we also discuss a bit about the single particle analysis which give you the capability to visualize as the atomic resolution of each of the proteins. So which means life is complex and we are using different technologies to understand at the different scales, but we need to combine them all together to understand human life. So that's the main thing of today's my talk is a multi scale of a year for life science research. So uh, this is a brief agenda of my talk of today. So we are talking about things at different levels. So first, I'd like to give you some insight about single particle analysis, which to understand the structural information of protein or protein microcomplex. Then we can talk about a little bit of a tomography, that is a protein's functions inside the cell. Then we, we can discuss a bit of a large volume analysis, which to understand as a tissue level. 
And if time allows, I'd like to give you some more insights about uh, uh, for this special session is how we can using EM to for the vaccination development, specifically focus on the Corona uh, COVID-19 virus uh, vaccination development. So first, let's take a very first step from the smallest topic of today is to understand the structure of proteins. So I believe you, you, if you have studied the structural uh, biology before, you know there's multiple approaches help us to understand uh, the structure of purified proteins, including the X-ray diffractions, we got XRD, NMR, and also today we're using the cryo em to uh, using the single particle analysis to understand the structure of the proteins. And for the cryo em actually there's a multiple applications involved, including the negative stainings, neural labelings, all these different applications can be done in one single uh, TEM. So first, let me give you some insight about the, the very basic to understand the protein structure called negative staining. So this topic actually we discussed in the previous session, so I'll just give you a quick go through about this. So the negative staining is very straightforward. It's using some heavy metal stain of the proteins or maybe the virus particles, give you some direct visualization of the protein structures uh, with, at the room temperature. And this is a very convenient method because within five minutes, you can able to visualize all the virus particles or protein surface information. For example, the example over here is including the bacteriophage T4 and some of the, the main streak of virus particles. You can see the fine information like the helical structures of bacteriophage. And also for, for some proteins, you also can see all the like some helical or some, some, some like secondary structures of proteins. But also there are some limitations of thank you things as the resolution limits you are like something around two nanometer or uh, five to two, two to five nanometers. So if you want to see something in your finer details, you need additional technologies and additional PEM. So we call the, today I'd like to share with you, it's about single particle analysis. So first, just give you a quick overview. This uh, approaches has been co-developed uh, 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 a group of uh, great scientists, especially including the Jack Duboche, Richard Henderson, and Yuki Frank. And the three of them have been awarded Nobel Prize in 2017. So this, this step, including the sample preparations and uh, data acquisition and the reconstruction of the 3D structures. By combining all the different technologies together, they will generate the structural information of the protein in 3D at uh, close to atomic resolution. Not only this, they also give you the fine information within the structure or within the protein, like different conformations and the different conditions, and also the, uh, the interactions between the proteins and with the light different ligands, which cannot be achieved using some other uh, methodologies. And for the CryoEM, we have a, a huge amount of publications involved in this field. You can see the number of publications is increasing exponentially every year. Just in last year, we got more than 1,000 publications and about like 200 of them has go to the top journals like Nature and Science and Cells. So really this is a, a, a field, like a lot of great scientists has getting involved and starting invest in this uh, research field for the structural information proteins. So compared with some other methodologies, including the X-ray crystallographies, NMR and the cryo-EM, each of them has its unique advantages and disadvantages. So compare uh, cryo-EM with uh, some other uh, uh, methodologies. The cryo-EM first is simple and straightforward. So sample prep is very simple. And the amount of sample required is minimal. And also they give you the capability to, to see, visualize a large protein complex, like the uh, like cytosome, including the RNA and the protein complex, which is very difficult to form a crystal, um, but is easily to be visualized in cryo-EM. And the note, if you, Already follow the news. Uh, the Nobel Prize for this year, uh, in 2021, Nobel Prize is uh, has been awarded for the for the thermal and the heat sensor. So this structural information has also been resolved using cryo EM uh, using uh, uh, the similar approach because the, the neural sensors is very difficult. It is the membrane proteins, so you cannot form a crystal easily. But using the cryo EM, you can resolve the complex structures. So they also give you the capabilities to visualize different conformations because we all know that uh, human protein is complex, is in, including different like, active, inactive uh, transitions between uh, multiple conformations. So cryo-EM give you the capability to visualize different conformations uh, from the single sample preparations. So all these uh, huge advantages make your cryo-EM a new 
breakthrough for structural biology. And for the scientists who are working a lot uh, previously with quail yen, are now moving forward to adapt uh, to, from X3 crystallography to quail yen. You can see the Nobel Prize winner from Rockefeller's, uh, Professor uh, Roderick uh, McKinno. So he used to work a lot on the potential channels using X3 crystallography from the synchrotrons. And now he's moving forward to resolve the structure using the quail yen uh, methodologies. So now, as I talk a lot about the uh, usefulness and uh, the different advantages of quail yen. So how this uh, single particle analysis works. So this movie actually I have, pre uh, I have played in the last time, but I just show you again, give you some more refreshment about understanding the principle of quail yen. So on my left is a cartoon drawing of the different steps, including the sample prep, data acquisition, and reconstruction of the 3D volume. And in this, uh, in the movie playing, uh, they give you a direct visualization of using the cartoon to help you understand how the sample is prepped and how the data is collected inside TN. Now you can see that we are applying a small amount of your protein inside the solutions. So the protein inside the solution behave more natively compared to the crystal, uh, uh, crystallized proteins. So they look more neutral uh, or when they look inside the human bodies. And we can put in this file TM grid inside the microscope and taking the, this micrograph. So this micrograph contains multiple like hundreds of the images of your protein particles. But the protein particle is, looks a bit blur because we are individualized individual protein directly. So, and also the protein is located in different orientations. So by using the software, we can help you identify the same protein from the same orientation and classify them, uh, edit them up to enhance the signal and classify the protein from different orientations into the different 2D class. So this represents the protein uh, from varying from different angles, which I will discuss in further details in the next slides. Then we can back project it, all this protein information into 3D volume and reconstruct it, uh, the, the protein from 2D projection image into the 3D volume. So the, all this is called the reconstruction. But the first initiation give you some, some rough idea how the protein looks like. Then we can go back again using the initial model to pick up more protein particles, do more fine uh, with, uh, refi refinement of your structures, then ultimately give your ultimate structure information of your protein complex. So as uh, the cartoon is showing just now, including multiple steps, starting from sample prep. So give you now give you more insight how the sample is prepped. So as I mentioned, the sample requirement is minimal, which means you only need one droplet of your sample like two to five microliter. So this is really uh, very easy to prepare prep compared to the X-ray or some other method. And with this uh, small droplet of your samples, you put on the surface of the TM grid and applying a filter paper, remove majority of the liquid, but leaving only a thin layer of your protein or micro complex and together with the buffer suspended in the middle. And the thickness of this layer is only within maybe 50 to 100 nanometers deep and including just one or two layers of protein complex. And this thin layer of uh, buffer and uh, protein mixture will be plant freeze into the liquid eating, we call cryogen, and plant freeze in a really short period of time. And this quick freezing will not formation of any of the we will not form any of the cubic or we call ice crystal. And instead, the water molecule will maintain as it is inside the solutions. So we call the vitrifications and maintain the amorphous state of your samples. So this make, make sure your sample is close to native condition as it is inside the grid. And this TM grid will be sent to the TM microscope. So on my left is a cartoon drawing of, a, of the toy dinosaur. So imagine you have 1 million of this uh, single toy dinosaur and suspended in the solutions. And then all this dinosaur first, it looks identical, but they're from different orientations. So what do you look, taking a, you can take a one image of this uh, mixture of different orientations of the toy dinosaurs. You can see some is looking from the top, some is looking from the side view, some is looking at the tail, but you know that they are from the same uh, toy dinosaur. So you can back project it, your dinosaur image, go to different orientations and reconstruct it, a 3D volume of your dinosaur image uh, uh, back to 3D, from 2D to 3D back projected. And on my right is a real time, uh, real examples, we call the SA proteins. You can see we got a micrograph of different assay proteins. So for human eyes, we cannot recognize anything from this. You can just see only different particles. 
But using the software, it can help you pick up all the different particles from this micrograph and classify them into different orientations. And also using the 3D reconstruction, you can reconstruct it and identify two different conformations. One is called the APOE assay, which means the bending of the protein is empty. Then the other is it has a bending of biotin inside the bending pocket. So this is very critical for some of the drug discoveries because we want to understand whether my protein has a drug bending inside or is empty. So it's a very important for the like, structure-based drug screening and drug discovery. And using this a simple approach, you can reach something around 3.2, 3.3 amps in resolution, which gives you the capability to visualize directly about individual sensing information of your protein. And to, to perform all this structural information and reconstruction, it requires different hardware and different technologies, including the biochemistry for sample preparations like HPLC or some other methodologies. And the virtual bot is the, the tool that we use for sample prep, sample verifications. It's an automatic robotic tools for sample prep. And the, for the quail TEM, including the play shows, uh, uh, quails, and also the talos, all different uh, TEM can help you understand the, taking the different images with a microscope. And from the hardware side, including different cameras and the energy filters. So now I'll just share with you some insight about the hardware requirements about these uh, setups and what is needed for a successful structural information determination, including the TEM. Over here, example, the QLG4 is our latest uh, QLTEM uh, microscope and energy filters, the selectrics and focus for direct electron uh, cameras. So combining different utilities, include, uh, then combining any filters, cameras, microscopes, then we come together to the ultimate resolution. So in last year, we got reached about 1.2 amps resolution on April 1st samples. So with this resolution, you are able to visualize individual atoms from your sample. So really, we got atoms in focus. So with this atomic resolution, you can see the, even the lightest atom from you is called a hydrogen atom. You can visualize each atom, its positions, and to understand, give you ultimate understanding of your structure of your protein. So the requirement for the microscope is very straightforward, including the, the stability of the microscope, you can see is very stable, the drift is minimal, and also the performance of your the beam and the electrons. Over here, you can see the E4 limit, which is about what, 0 0.12 nanometers, and the linear distortions, which means that when you take an image, the on the X, Y different orientations, whether there is any difference on different orientations. So the first, it gives you the best performance on microscope, and next, you require an energy filter. So what is this energy filter is when the electrons going through the samples, so some of the electron will interact with the sample elastically, we call it elastic scattering. And some of the samples will be lose some energies called the inelastic scattering. So when we form the image, we want to use the only the, the, uh, the electron with the same number of energy called elastic scattering. So the energy filter can help you filter out the useful electrons and eliminate the no noisy electrons, which will contribute only to the noise of your image. So using the energy filters, so you can see that we, we capture this so-called zero loss peak, which represents the electrons as no energy loss, but contribute only to the signal of the samples. So you compare these two images with no filtering and with a 10 EV energy filter, you can see a clear uh, boost of the signal noise ratios that increase the contrast of the image. So using the energy filter that can enhance the image contrast, the further boost the signal will give you a better uh, image quality. So after the electron going through the energy filters, it comes to the detector, we call it uh, our camera. So there's a lot of camera present, even the iPhone has uh, megapixel cameras. But the, for the camera we are discussing over here called a direct electron detector, which means they can detect the electron events directly. So it, first they have the best performance called DQE, and they also use fast cameras, including different formats and uh, on the flight data monitoring uh, enhancement. So why the direct electron is important? Because compared to the traditional CCD cameras, which needed to translate the electron signal to optical signal, including the scintillator layers and optical fibers, then come to the uh, detector. Then using the direct electron detectors, you can capture the individual event, electron events directly. So which means one good example over here is this actually is uh, a bit old. Uh, you can clearly visualize the virus particle and also see the, the surface spike proteins, some other and inside the virus particle, you can see very crisply 
a crispy shell of the image. Then the following the direct electron detector is designed for the, uh, the camera require a large pixel because we are, when we capture the electrons, we capture the whole journey of the electron. You can see that when the electron going through the detectors, they generate the both signal but also contribute to noise. So the large uh, pixel uh, values give you the most of the signal ratios uh, guarantee your best uh, image quality. So combining all these uh, you, uh, advantage of technologies, we can generate good, uh, good quality image, but that's not enough because uh, when the electrons hit your samples, the sample is actually is not steady like over there, but actually is drifting both in the Z orientations and X orientations. So if you take only one simple image, actually the image is a bit blurry. So to capture a more refined image, you need to capture instead of one steady image, you take a movie of the image. So you capture all the motion of the particles inside the microscope. So over here, we can using the movie image, and including both some software to process the image, then we can capture individual frame of your motion of your proteins using the softwares to eliminate the very drifted frame, but align the useful frame together. You can see that on my left, the panel A is only one, one image. This is quality is actually is quite good, but using the motion corrections, which will align different movie frames, you can see the even sharper image are taken from the, uh, uh, after the motion corrections. So combining all the both the advantage, advantage using the hardware and the software, then using this camera give you the best inequalities, then come to the best structural information from the sample. So in some, including some other advances in the hardware like the AFIS and also the FFI, then really increase the throughput in this setup. And also the, the microscope coupled with uh, an autoloader system, which give the capabilities to load up to 12 samples in one go. And all the sample information can be easily screened using the microscope. So after screening the microscope, so the operation is also straightforward because some of the users realize uh, it requires a lot of trainings and practice to get your data analysis. So using this setup to give you a very free, straightforward, so user no need to learn a bit difficult alignment, but using the software they can have you directly acquire the image and including the other flight data positions and analysis. So combining all the improvement of the hardware and the software, we really can resolve the fine details of your structural information. So over here, I just share with you some basic information what we can get from single particle analysis, including both of the different infectious diseases like with the, the coronavirus, African swing flu, Ebola, Zika virus. And from the structural information, first we can understand the surface information of different virus particles, like the influenza virus, you understand the surface information you can using the structure to design the different treatments like drug treatments or antibodies and vaccinations. And also to understand the structural information, you can understand how the different bacteria or virus using different structural mutations to escape from our drug treatment, we call the super bug. And using the structural information, we can design specific treatment to fight against our different mutations within the bacteria to fight against the uh, rest. Uh, antibiotic resistance uh, bacteria, like the coronavirus, which I will give you more fine details in the following uh, following sections. Using the structural information, we understand the surface spike proteins and how the spike protein interact with the human receptor or ACE2 receptors. So all this information is very critical to design a successful vaccination to fight against the Zika virus. For example, the professor uh, Zhang Peijun and Professor uh, Li Sai from both from uh, EBIC and also the Tsinghua University to design different approaches to understand how the virus replicate inside host cells and how the virus like surface spike proteins interact with the human receptors and also how the virus uh, spike proteins motion on the surface of the virus particles. So to understand all the fine details of the infectious, uh, when the outside host, inside host, we can design different antibodies different treatments, different vaccinations to fight against this virus. And not limited to the virus particles, like the insulin, some communicable disease, non communicable disease, diabetes, cancers, neurodegenerative disease, the structural information also critical. For example, like the Asmos disease, which including the neuron uh, plaque, there's some protein aggregation inside the neuron cells. 
to understand the, how these are alpha or beta protein aggregate inside neurons and form the plaque, how the structures is replicate and form the crystal, and it's very critical to fight against the Asperger's disease. Another example, like the T cell receptors, and also some other insulin, uh, insulin and insulin receptor complex structure information is very useful for the pharmaceutical companies to design suitable insulin recombinant insulin and also some other treatment for the insulin resistance. And one actual example I can share with you is a GABA receptor. Because GABA is very important for the neurological research. It's, it's related with the insomnia, anxieties, and also some, some anxious disease from neurons. So using the structural information, we can resolve like 1.7 extra resolution. And also we can clearly see not only the GABA receptors, but also different binding uh, ligands. For example, the tisamine, which is binding over here. And then using this information, we can use it as a very useful platform for different drug screenings. So the different pharmaceutical companies has already, uh, based on the structural information, designed different drug treatment for like uh, uh, insomnia treatment and also uh, like uh, obesity treatment from these receptors. Yes, so one good example is also including the uh, GPCR receptor. So on the FDA, FDA, uh, FDA drug designs, about 30% of drugs is targeting GPCR. But GPCR is a transmembrane protein and it's very difficult to form a crystal. And Pro Professor Patrick Sexton from the National University has been focused on the GPCR research for many years. And they are able to resolve the GPCR, including both the G complex and G proteins, large complex, at different resolutions. And also they're working together with different pharmaceutical companies using different GPCR families, uh, family numbers to design different drugs. So two different drugs I can share with you then, and then highlight some more importance of the structural information. So one drug is from um, uh, Novo NanoDisc. So this is called the uh, uh, semaglutide. And another drug, drug is from Roche, we call the tasoglutide. Both of these two different drugs are almost identical if you only look at the structural information. But when they binding to the GPCR receptors, it behaves slightly different. So all these tiny difference on the structure between different ligands and receptors makes the, the successful or failure of different drugs. So the, the first drug, we make it very successful about two, two million on the overall pharmaceutical market. But the, the second drug, which fail and face three trials just because of tiny difference on the structural information. So the Roche, all the investment is failed because they, they could not identify uh, the structure, fine details of the structural information between these, uh, these drugs and another drugs. And so they give a very strong set effect on the phase three trial. So what I share with you just now is some basic information about single particle analysis how we can use in this approach to understand different protein and protein complex structures. And based on the structural information, how we can design different like anti uh, antibodies, different vaccinations, and also some, how the pharmaceutical uh, companies using the information to design different drugs. So now we come to the first, uh, first break. So these are quiz questions. Please see the chat channels. They will be posted uh, on the chat to see different quiz questions. And also we can take about uh, a, a short break over here to answer some of the questions for the first session. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Shin, for your interesting talk. This is just the first session, but it's uh, yes. interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks for sharing about the single particle analysis, especially using cryo EM, and it's very rapid preparation, and we don't need the large amount of the sample for yeah, this, right? right? So it's very advantageous, uh, especially you also show the uh, application in the medical uh, field. Oke okay, Bapak Ibu, baik uh, sekarang kita masuk ke quiz satu untuk panitia apakah sudah di share pertanyaannya? Oke okay, baik di chat room sudah terlihat ada link untuk quiz silahkan Bapak Ibu uh, diklik uh, linknya kemudian dikerjakan <laughs> pertanyaannya diberi waktu tiga menit dan sambil uh, menunggu quiz. Kita juga buka sesi pertanyaan. Oke, okay, Dr. Sin, uh, we're waiting for the quiz. Uh, there is one question in the chat room from Alista Balkis. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, I'm trying to do preparation for my sample of oil palm fluids. However, when making resin block, my sample fluids on the resin and 
fall at the of the resin block. Which the photo or the photo is um, in a page in the chapter. Hmm. Suggestion so I can make a good resin block so I can section it. Yeah. Okay, and and thank you very much for the question. I think this is a very practical question because we all know that palm oil is an important industry in the Southeast Asia, not limited to Indonesia, but also like even Malaysia and some other Southeast Asia countries. And I think your question is related to how we can make a successful racing block using these uh, palm oil uh, samples. I think this is a very uh, useful question. But uh, to be uh, very honest with you, I have a very limited experience with uh, palm oil samples. But I believe that uh, we have a very strong application team in Shanghai who has a wide range of application experience. So what I can do is I can pass your questions to the Shanghai team and in the next sessions, uh, or maybe later, I can communicate with you uh, directly through emails for your uh, specific question on how we can prepare a sample, a palm oil samples uh, with the racing block. And thank you very much for your question. I think this is a very useful question and is very practical for, for us, especially uh, as this uh, resources issue. I think it's also very useful for me as well. Thank you, Dr. Sin. Mbak uh, Alista, Ibu Alista dari Sukuba, from Sukuba. Uh, jadi tadi untuk resin sebenarnya saya juga pernah ibu apa namanya memprepare sampel waktu itu adalah akar padi, tapi kemudian dia juga tidak masuk ke bawahnya resin begitu ya. Jadi pada saat resin embedding itu saya coba terus masukin supaya dia bisa masuk ke bawah. Tapi tadi seperti yang diinformasikan oleh Dr. Sin, mungkin pada sesi selanjutnya akan diberikan informasi lebih detail lagi. Terima kasih, Ibu. Atau Mbak Aliska dari Sukuba atas pertanyaan. Oke, okay, I think it's already three minutes. Oke, okay, oke, okay, thank you. So now let's see the quiz questions. So yes. the first question is, what is the thickness of the virtual ice suitable for the single particle analysis? I think I have uh, studies are very clearly in my presentations. Uh, so apparently if you if you look at the, the answer over here, it's very easy to guess. So the other, the correct answer is, 50 to 100 nanometer. So the if your sample if your sample is too thick, so electron cannot go through. Uh, you only see the, the dark image. So it's very important uh, not only to life science but to most of the cryo EM or the TEM applications. You, your sample needs to be thin enough for the electron to go through it. So the correct answer is number D, 50 to 100 nanometer. And the second question is which sample can be imaged using a single particle? Which is what type of sample is suitable for this? So you can see we listed uh, different uh, different samples, including various particles, purified protein, protein RNA or DNA complex, or even bacterial fish. And all of them is suitable for single particle. So single particle can be suitable for a wide range of samples, your different structure information for you to understand. And the last question is, what is the final resolution you can get from single particle applications? So single particle is a very powerful tool to so give you really the fine details of your structure information. So as I mentioned previously in, in last year, we have a very good publication in Nature, which come to 1.2 Amstrong resolution. So, so the answer will be uh, E, you give you a few Amstrongs. So within these resolutions, you are able to see fine details of proteins. So even at like three to four Amstrong resolution, you even you can see all the side chain informations, like from your uh, from your proteins, then help you understand the interactions, like the active binding pockets of your structure information with your drug target and also the protein-protein interactions like the antibody antigen uh, interactions, the ligand bindings. So it's a very powerful tool. So now without further delay, I'd like to move to the second topic of my today is now we are moving from the one step further, moving from the structure of proteins to the uh, what, how the proteins function inside the cell. Because as I mentioned a couple of times, the life, life science is complex. We are looking at things at different scales and we have to combine them everything together. So now let's see how the protein functions inside the cell. We call the cryotomography. And the tomography is important information because on my left, we can see some uh, confocal image, which is very beautiful, including the nucleus, some like actin filament or some other stained proteins. And also on my, on my right is a structural information from single particles. And the cryotomography combining all this information together because they give you both the high resolution and also is within the cell. So you understand the protein, how it functions within the native environment. So how this uh, single uh, cryotomography works? 
you can see that on the left is a very beautiful uh, kafoko image. You, you, you can see very a lot of fine details within the cell. But the, there's a couple of problems. First, you only can see what is staining because within the cell, there will be more complicated than you imagine. In, or even everyone, there's nobody in the, in the world can understand everything within just individual cells. But you only can see from the confocals what you stain. You only can see nucleus, mitochondria, and also the uh, maybe the ER filament. But there's many things other than that. So in cryotomography, you can see the finer details within the, the cell. For example, there's a one small section within the nuclear peripheral regions. You can see the nuclear pore complex, the ribosomes uh, uh, subunit, all the different actin filaments, some ER membranes, some other microtubules. So it's very complex structures inside the cell. Right? It's more than more crowded than everyone imagined. And this across tomography is very quite straightforward. It's taking the image as the TEM and also the tilting at the different angles. So you're taking uh, the single object from different tilting angles and reconstruct it into 3D volume. And as I mentioned a couple of times, the, the thickness of sample is very critical. So you have to make it thin enough that makes the electron able to go through it. So that's why we need a cryo-focused IMP. So this is a very similar to Dr. Reza introduced you uh, in our previous talks. We also the same dual beam system, but this is a more dedicated design for life science applications for cell and the tissue samples. So before we start, I just share with you a short movies and give you an overview of how this uh, cryotomography works. First, you can see there is a, uh, some cell uh, under the confocal microscope. You can see some uh, GFP signals and some other signals. And cell will be plant freeze, which is similar to single particle applications on the TEM grid. And this TEM grid will be sent to the cryofib uh, platform called Aquilos in these examples. So this is also a dual beam platform, including both the electron beam and also the ion beam. So electron beam will take the image of the cell and the ion beam will be focused and remove the material from the cell and make it thin enough to let the electron go through. So they will remove, they are cutting two windows, one on top, one on bottom, and leaving one, we call the quail lamina, suspended in the middle. So the thickness of this quail lamina is around like 150 to 250 nanometer in thickness. So it depends on how much information you want to retain and what is the resolution you want to achieve. And this thin cryo lamina will be transferred to the cryo TEM, which I shared with you previously, like cryos, glaciers. Then all this, you can collect it, uh, the because tilt series with it tilting the samples inside the, the stage of the microscope. So all these tilt series will be back projected into the 3D volume and using the software reconstructions, using the AMIRA for the uh, segmentations and imaging, they will generate the, we call the tomography data sets. And using the tomography data set, you can understand both your protein and protein complex and maybe some of the organelle functions inside the cell as close to native uh, conformations. So uh, as well, all this works including different components, including the sample preparation, which we introduced previously for the vitrifications, and also the fluorescence information we can use in the Leica fluorescence, and also we have integrated light microscope inside the microscope, uh, inside aqueous as well which I will share with you later. And for Aquilos, is our cryofilm meeting UB platform, which can thin your samples, make it around cryo lamina. And your lamina will be imaged inside the cryo TEM and be visualized using the AMIRA software. So first, just give you a quick go through different steps, including the sample prep. And we can, for some of samples, like protein samples or cellular samples, we can use in a similar approach, like grow the cell on the surface of your TEM grid, and plunge free into liquid thing with allergens. And for some other samples, which is too big, like the, some tissue samples, organ samples, then we can use the high pressure freezing uh, approach to produce a, a much larger uh, block of samples. And now just to uh, play another movie, which maybe I show you in the last time already. So this show you how the sam sample is prepared by growing the cell on the surface of TM grid and transfer the grid to the uh, virtual bot is for the sample verifications and the plant free is automatically using the virtual bot. So the whole process is quite straightforward. You can see the cell is growing on the surface of TM grid to transfer on the virtual bot and using the filter paper to remove majority of the uh, buffers of the culture media 
from the surface of the cell cultures. And this TM grid will be pumped freeze into liquid eating. So there will be directly pumped freeze. And so actually there's a two portions of cell, like the, the thinner portion of the neurons, which is a very thin on the edge, you can image directly. But for the thicker portions, we need to make it using the film meeting platform, make it thinner enough uh, to, to see through that. So one good example you can see over here, the peripheral region, which is thin enough, you can image directly using the tomography. And for the thicker regions, we can use the cryo clause for cryo field meetings, make it thinner and to visualize with a tomography approach. So the aculos, uh, which is uh, previously shown in the movie, so just to give you a brief uh, overview again, including the both SEM and FIB. So the, 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 we call all that's why we call the dual beam. And the SEM is an imaging purpose, and FIB will remove the material from samples and making a thin lamina in the middle of the cell. So this is a, uh, this is a one good example is a green algae or clamidomas, which is a very useful uh, model means. So you can see this uh, this green algae is growing on the surface of the TM grid. And using the cryofit meaning, then we can remove the material from both the top and bottom and leaving a very thin lamina suspended in the middle. And on my, on my right, you can see the, how this uh, lamina looks like in the TEM. So you can clearly visualize like the, uh, some nuclear area, the starch granule, some of the ER protein structure information directly from this uh, TEM uh, uh, image. Then you can tilt in this uh, uh, lamina inside the microscope then generate the tomography data set and reconstruct it using software and image using material. And, but this is a, looks very complicated, but uh, actually no worries. All the process can be done automatically using the automation software. You can see that we can prepare up to like 20 or 25 parameters uh, overnight using the automation software. So over here, I just play again this uh, short video how we can prepare 20 parameters within one minute because of the acceleration of the video. You can see that it's a very straightforward. So the user only need to select okay, which cell I want to do the cryo meetings. After selected multiple target, the rest will be done automatically using the uh, software, including, for example, they cut two junctions next to the uh, lamina just to release the, some of the tensions inside. Then they study from the rough meaning. After the rough meaning, there will be do some fine meanings in each of the lamina set. You can see that all the process with the minimal human interventions. So all you need to do is to select the suitable site, then you can click, then you can go home. So in the next mornings, your lamina will be uh, is ready for you to use. And the second approach over here is instead of using the TEM, you can visualize your cellular information directly inside the cryo uh, inside the cryo FIB uh, chambers. We call the cryo size and view. So this is uh, actually, this is a uh, one step further because you can see uh, the macro information inside the cellular. And then by slicing one layer of your samples, taking one SEM image, then slicing the second layer. Um, this is a, a step-by-step function, taking one layer image, slice second layer, then you can combine all the stack information together, then generate a 3D, 3D volume. So th in this application, there's a no need for the contribution of the TEM. You can visualize the structural information inside the uh, STB chambers directly. This is a very useful for some of like large samples, for example, uh, high pressure freezing samples, because from these samples, it's very difficult to capture the exact location of your interest area. For example, some neural area, you want to see some neural junctions, but it's not very easy to really capture the specific area. So using this approach, and you we can help you visualize which is your original interest for the uh, later processing. So my addition uh, function over here is to access your large trunk of area using the cryo default. So just now what I share with you called the cryo lamina, which means you produce a one thin lamina in the middle of your cell samples. So what if you have a much larger, much thicker area and you want to approach from different angles. So using this uh, cryo default approaches, you can access much larger area, for example, like hypergy freezing samples. So I believe Dr. Reza has introduced a lot about the default. So give you some approaches for different sample areas, then produce this bulk of area into the uh, additional cryofit meetings, you know, make it thin enough for electron to go through, also produce a lab on the second TEM grid. So this is a quite straightforward, uh, which I will not give you like, too much uh, 
too much details. But we'll just give you a very brief uh, introduction. You cut out one area from your regional interest, for example, one cellular area. Then using the one thin needle, we call the uh, easy lift. So this thin needle can pick up uh, this chunk of, of bulk of information and attach it to the second TEM grid. And this, this, uh, this, your samples can be further thinned down to a couple of hundred nanometers, uh, make it thin enough for the electron to go through it. And then you can produce a, a lamina out of this uh, bulky area from your samples. So they give you the capabilities to, to access some area which is very difficult to approach, like the, maybe the, the thin, thicker area of your cell, or maybe you want to approach it from different orientations, or maybe like the high pressure feed samples can be done using the quality photo approach. So on the movie, you can see that this needle has been attached uh, to this uh, bulk of your area, uh, and your trunk of your samples. Now they're going to leave it out. And the leave out area will be attached to the second TM grid, we call the half moon grid. They have four different fingers pointing out. And this, this, this volume of the sample will be attached to the one, each of the fingers and be uh, further thin, nailed down uh, to the thin enough for the further uh, TM uh, imaging tomography data position. So now the cryo lamina is ready for the further image acquisition. Yeah, so this is also illustrate how we can approach the same applications using the high pressure freezing samples. It's very similar for the sample preparation on the TM grid. So after get your sample ready, the next is to collect your data. And for the data collection, it's also quite automatic because we have the tomography softwares including all the sample screenings, uh, dose symmetric cute scheme, and fine tuning of your data acquisition, exposure, uh, like focus and tracking areas, and collecting the uh, cute series automatically. So after collecting your samples, then you need to visualize it because it's just uh, grayscale or black and white. So using the Amira software, you can easily segment it and visualize your different information. For example, over here, you can see some cellular information like uh, Gauguis and some nucleopore complex. Using the Amira software, they can easily easy visualize segmented different components within the cells, and giving different colors of your Gauguis apertures, like cis Gauguis, trans Gauguis, give different colors, and all the different vesicles, or microtubules, and things, assign different colors for them. So give you a direct visualization on the 3D, how does proteins, protein micro complex organize and function within the cell. And Amira is a very powerful software. It's not only limited to the, not limited to only the surface rendering segmentations. They also do a lot of uh, quantitative analysis. For example, you can see all the different uh, vesicles inside the cellular information. Then you can study the surface information, the membrane structures, and also the volume information for each of the individual particles. You can do some statistic groupings and a lot of, a lot of uh, useful uh, analysis from this software. So combining all the useful hardware and software together, we can see the fine details of your protein information within the cell. So one good example is also from the Camille Thomas. You can see the, all these vesicles segment, segmented from the Gauguin aperture. So on the surface of your vesicles is coated with a COP proteins. So you can see the enrichment of the proteins on the site or on the surface of the, some of the trans, uh, transmission particles and also on the side of the binding particles. So all this fine information is cannot be seen using uh, some different approaches by using cryo tomography, including both the uh, advanced hardware and software, so you can visualize them directly. And now let me share with you some useful application examples, which can be analysis using the cryo tomography. So one good example over here is called the, to understand the protein's functions inside the cell. So then my, my, one of my favorite example is this 20S protein salt, which is responsible for the degradations and protein regulations inside cell. And this 20S protein salt has different conformations, like active and uh, like activation, inactivation, both ground and processing state. And also different conformations are enriched and different components within the cell. 
So using the crowd tomography, you can easily visualize all the different conformation of the protease in the cell. And you also can understand its functionalities at different components of the cell. For example, you can see that a lot of these uh, 20 s proteins are enriched next to a nuclear pore complex, which repre represent, regulate the import and export of proteins in, and inside and outside the nucleus, and also regulate some of the protein quality controls at this site. And some other good examples is to understand the cellular information inside the cytoplasm to see different conformations of your uh, conjunctions of different tubulin structures together with the ribosome complex next to the nuclear pore complex. And also they contribute a lot to understand how the structural information of the coronavirus inside the host cell. So as I shared with you previously from Dr. Saidi, who studied the, the, the spike proteins on the surface of your coronavirus particles, and also the tilting and wiggling of different angles of these uh, spike proteins. And also uh, from doctor, uh, some other research groups to understand the virus replications inside the host, host cells. You can see all the different double membrane structures using the crowd tomography applications to see the virus replications and release and the genome assemblies inside the host, host cell. Yeah, so just now what I share with you is some basic information about the crowd tomography workflows, how the sample is prepped, how the data is collected and reconstructed, and what can be done using crowd tomography. Now we come to the second session of the quiz. So you can use the Google form to answer some of the questions I have posted. And using this time, we can uh, discuss uh, some questions you have from audience. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sin. It's really excellent. We can see the three-dimensional model of uh, our subject. Yes. Okay, uh, so the, Bapak Ibu, uh, quiznya sudah dibuka. Silakan dilihat di chat room. Ada linknya, silakan diklik saja. Waktunya sama sampai tadi yang menit. Dan dipersilakan apabila Bapak Ibu ada pertanyaan, boleh bertanya langsung. Silakan raise hand. Atau boleh dituliskan juga di chat room. Boleh bahasa Inggris, boleh bahasa Indonesia, bahasa Sunda juga boleh. Silakan. So you to actually uh, crowd tomography is a very useful tool to understand both the structural information and the cellular information. So anyone who has experience with a confocal microscopy or like fluorescence microscope can easily adapt these new technologies. So combining all the confocal information together with the crowd tomography information to understand both the functions of different components of your cell and also understand the structural information. So what I what I did not show over here is to find details how the uh, uh, different structural information can be aligned between confocal image and the uh, SEM image and also PEM image. Because our latest advance uh, on the aquilos is by integrated one fluorescence microscope inside the chamber of aquilos, which gives the capability to visualize both the fluorescence information together with SEM image and also combine them all together inside the TEM. So which means you can using the like GLP labeling of your sum of your protein interest and using this uh, fluorescence information to find the range of interest inside the cell and to feed me your cells and to, to locate your this region and further to analyze the fine details within crowd tomography. So combining different approaches uh, together. That's like a correlative microscopy, the, both the fluorescence and also electron microscope, right? Yes, that's right. No, very excellent. Mm -hmm. It is a correlative workflows, and everything is included inside one tool, which means you do not need like multiple microscopes, one confocal, the other fluorescence, or another light microscope for you to image the light microscope information. But everything is combined together inside one platform. So I, I think this is a new trend for the further research than is uh, for the future uh, future development directions. Yeah, that's very convenient. We can detect the antibody as well as the uh, yes, exactly. That's right. Any okay, so three minutes already. Yes. All right. So let's see together about our quiz questions. So the first question over here is uh. Which of the following is not suitable for crowd tomography? So you can see I listed uh, four different answers, and actually the answer is number E. So all of these samples is suitable for crowd tomography. 
So you can see a small event for the protein structures information can be resolved using Kautomo. So as large as some of the tissues, for example, the C. elegans or some of the zebra fish, a smaller sections from hypertrophy samples, all the tissue information even can be visualized. So it's a wide range of samples suitable for Kautomo. So second question is uh, which sample preparation methodology is not suitable for Kautomo? So including four different sample plan, uh, sample vitrifications, hypertrophizing, healthy means, uh, which I do not discuss over here, it's called file sections. So this cryo section is similar to our room temperature section, but instead of at room temperature, you can uh, put your ultramectome at cryo temperature and section your samples and image your sections at cryo temperature. So all, all this methodology is suitable for cryo So uh, So all four different methodologies can be, can be done using cryo so I hope you all get the answer correct. Now, just with, without further delay, so I think I still have like 40 minutes. So now I'm moving one step further to discuss something about uh, one step further from cellular and to the tissue level to understand how we can see the life in a one step larger scale than to see the tissue level. Because the human body is complex, the cell will need to talk to each other from different tissues like muscles, kidneys, lungs. So all these different uh, cell types, like different determinations of your different cell types form a very complex uh, environment inside the tissues. So to understand this, we need called a large volume analysis. So how this uh, large volume analysis has been done, including, uh, and we'll share with you three different methodologies. The first, actually, I will give a very brief talk already in a close sections, called a slice and view, which means using the focus IMD, you're cutting one layer of your samples, you're taking one image, you're cutting second layer, using the focus IMD, you're taking second image. So that's why we call a slice and view, slice and view, then you're forming uh, volume information from your, from your samples. And the second approach is uh, we call the serial block face imaging. So this is a very similar approach compared to the slice and view because it's also slice and view. But the slicing over here is instead of using the focus IMD, beam, we are using the uh, diamond knife called ultra microtome. So which means we are including one ultra microtome inside the ICM chambers. So you're doing the slice and view inside the chamber. You're using the ultra microtome cutting one layer of samples. Then you're using ICM taking one layer of information. And then following you're cutting second layer and imaging second layer. So compared to the previous approach using the focus IMD. beam, so using the ultra microtome, they give you a much larger area or much larger volume uh, you can access up to maybe four, 400 or 500 nan micrometer in the volume information. And the last application called Eritomo. So this is also a, a bit similar to the volume scope or cell block phase imaging. It's also slice and view. But the slicing is done using uh, 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 additional uh, segmentation ultra microtome. And all the each of the slice has been collected using this out called the conductive tape. So the slice has been done in one go, then the imaging will be imaged, is an SEM. So the, the, the steps is a, a slightly different, but the rationale is similar. Just cutting the samples, then imaging them. But the cutting can be done by focus ion beam, ultra microtome inside the chamber, or the ultra microtome outside the chamber. And the imaging will be done using the SEM. So over here, it gives you a direct visualization of uh, each of the steps, including the cell block phase imaging. We call the ultra microtome cutting and imaging, cutting image each steps. The erythromal is using the sections. You collect your sections on the conductive tape and place it on the wafers. Then you do the following image. And also using the slice and view using the focus ion beam. Then you can cut your sample with the focus ion beam, doing the imaging. For the second cutting, then do the imaging. But what I also like to share with you today, instead of using the focus MD, we got the, got the plasma feed. So using the much more powerful plasma and to cut in, it give you the capabilities to access even much larger volume. So first I'd like to play a short video and give you the, some ideas how the volume scope or the cell block phase imaging works. So Dr. Uh, Astari, on my video, there'll be some, uh, uh, some audios so please make sure you can you can hear the audio from the video from your side. The aprio VS is it? It's clear. The audio is. 
Thank you. That combines mechanical and optical suction using our proprietary multi-energy deconvolution technology to facilitate automated acquisition of large sample volumes at isotropic resolution with CruiseSight. You can now automate producing 3D volume data at high resolution in a non-destructive manner. First, an ultra-thin section of the block face is removed using a diamond knife. Then, using a low-energy electron beam, the first structural information is acquired at a shallow subsurface level. Then, using a higher beam energy, the next subsurface level of structural information is acquired. By applying increasingly higher beam energies, structural information is acquired at multiple levels. Then, using proprietary software, ThruSight automatically extracts this information and produces high-resolution 3D volume data. Following optical section and using ThruSight, the next ultra-thin section is removed from the block face using the diamond knife. Through reiteration of physical and optical sectioning, Aprio VX offers isotropic data sets with excellent Z resolution at less than 10 nanometers, independent of the slice thickness. For reliable results and data segmentations, you can conduct isotropic imaging at high resolution and produce precise 3D data every time. And we'll appreciate the automated process that's efficient and easy to use. The final results can be easily visualized and analyzed using our highly flexible visualization and simulation software, Amelia. Aprio VS is a robust, powerful, fully automated solution in 3D volume imaging of biological samples to further our understanding of complex biological events from cell to tissue at nanometer resolution. You can three-dimensionally visualize the structures of interest, such as synapses, for reconstruction of neuronal circuits to help reveal cellular system ultrastructure. Through automated acquisition, substantial volumes of neuronal tissue at high resolution can be imaged, allowing the reconstruction of larger circuits. Aprio VS is a novel serial block phase imaging solution that combines mechanical and optical section, a new way of resolving large biological sample volumes at isotropic resolution. To learn more about how the Aprio VS can help you get the highest quality isotropic 3D data from your large sample volumes, go to thermofisher.com forward slash Aprio dash VS. Yeah, so thank you everyone. So just now in a short video, I hope you got some basic understandings how the volume scope works. So in general, it's a SEM combining with a one ultra microtome inside the chambers, which means you will be using the ultra microtome cutting your samples, then you're taking one image from the SCM. So also in the introductions, I also share with you the SCM for the multi-energy deconvolutions, which means you can see different thickness or the different landing energies of your electrons reach out different depths of your samples. So you can give you a much finer resolution from your samples. And the data acquisitions and reconstructions can be done using the automation software, like map software and the amino software. So this uh, volume scope is very convenient to use and help you to understand the volume information from your samples. So I will not give you like fine details about the specification of the microscope, but instead I think the very important spec I only talk to you is uh, for most of the life science samples is uh, not conductive. So the conductivity of sample is also troubles a lot for different users. So this uh, volume scope able to image your samples in both the high vacuum conditions uh, for the most conductive samples, and also able to image as a low vacuum conditions. So this low vacuum conditions give you capabilities to image your life science samples, which is not very good at the conductivities, uh, a much better uh, resolution as a low vac vacuum. And also over here, you can see I play another video just to demonstrate how the cutting of the microtome inside the chambers. You can see that we got a one diamond knife and there's the one block semi mounted on, on, the, on the sample holders. So the diamond knife will be inside chamber cutting your sections uh, automatically using the software controls. And each, each of the sections visibly around 400, uh, uh, 40 nanometer in the thickness. And not only limited on the physical cuttings, by using the optical cuttings, we got the multi energy deconversions, uh, they apply different landing energy of the electron to your samples, which means they can further boost the resolution on the z-axis to up to 10 nanometer. 
which means your physical cutting is each of sections is around 40 nanometer in the thickness, physical thickness. By using different landing energies, you are able to reach about 10 nanometer uh, resolution on the z-axis. So using this approach, we can reach around x, y, z directions about 10 uh, nanometer in the isotropic uh, voxels. So over here, this uh, uh, short video, which played uh, as well, they demonstrate how the, this uh, MET is done. You can see that by approaching different landing energies, they reach at the different depths of your samples. So which means the first layer may be uh, much weaker of electrons, the second layer slightly stronger, the third layer a bit stronger, and uh, the fourth layer is the most stronger different electrons. So different landing energy reach different depths, they give you the optical slicing of the samples. So combining both the physical cutting and the optical slicing, they can reach about 10 nanometer on the resolution. So you can see the comp comparison of the physical cutting and optical cutting of the different depths of the samples. So what can be done using this volume scope? So since we are looking at something uh, much larger, so I just show you some large samples that we have. So one good sample over here from zebrafish is a small zebrafish embryos. Uh, you can see that we have visualized the almost entire head of this uh, zebrafish. So including all the neurons, the, the different tissues, and you, the most catching part is uh, two, two of these eyes of this uh, zebrafish. So you can see all the first is different locations uh, of different cells, neurons, and some of the fine details of the embryo structures. And using the Amira software, uh, you are able to reconstruct it, the different sections at different layers into the 3D volume. So, and also using the software, you're able to segment it different components of the, of different, uh, of these uh, fish embryos, like different neural layers on the eyes tissues, uh, different retinas and neural optical fibers, and some other tissues in different colors. So this is a very powerful tool for understand your, your information uh, in 3D. And also, as I mentioned, because of the different uh, optical sections, you can reach also in large volume into the, at the uh, nanometer scale resolution. And the second application I can share with you is also from the uh, zebrafish, but this is looking much uh, finer, finer information is the, the retina layers and the, the eye, eye structures, different, different layer of tissues. You can see that for the volume we have is around 100 micrometer. So compared to what I share with you about single particle and cryotomo is only at the, uh, at the Armstrong resolution and the, uh, also the nanometers, a uh, uh, couple of uh, micrometers uh, scales. Over here is hundreds of micrometer scales. And previous example is even up to maybe a couple of uh, hundred uh, micrometer scales. But from this uh, final example, you can see that all the components of the retina structures, optical nerves, and how this a different layer of cells has been organized on the eye tissues. And not only single sections of the of your samples, but give you the volume information, different structures, how the cell, different layer of cells, and how the optical fibers has been, how this bundle of optical nerve has been placed within the retinas. So this is a very important for you to understand because for life science, everything is placed in 3D. So only one section is not very sufficient for you to understand the whole big pictures. But to understand your things in 3D is very important to understand how the, to see a big picture of the whole structure information. So not only this, you can use the, using the Amira software, we can reconstruct it, the whole volume into 3D and assign different colors to different layer of cells. So just now what I share with you is a one simple approach we call the cell block phase imaging, or Eric uh, called a volume scope, is to embed it one ultra microtome inside the chambers and second samples and take an image. So now I'd like to share with you additional application called peritomo, which is a very similar approach. Just the difference is that to separate the sections into the ultra microtome and imaging inside the ICM. So the section and the imaging is uh, two separate steps. But it also has a certain advantage because these sections can be preserved, which means we can prepare your sections, then you can image the specific area of your interest. But the sample will be, will be preserved, which means you can have a second image, you can keep it for a couple of months, then you can have a third image. So you also can preserve the samples. And this is a quite straightforward. 
first you have your sample different sections on a conductive tape then you arrange your tape on the on the array of wafers then using the map softwares you can automatically image each of each of the sections automatically and they also can particularly if you have some regional interest you can image the particular area of the samples then using the Amira software together with maps your, for your data acquisitions, then using the Amira software, you constructed your samples into 3D volume. So it's a very straightforward method, including the sections into the section uh, ultramectron, then taking the image inside the STM and reconstruct it using the Amira software. So one good example we've taken from Harry Tomo is, uh, uh, is from C. Elegant. You can see that uh, even the uh, sample is from life science samples, there's no charging effect from this because it's attached to the uh, conductive tape and the wafers. So there is no worry about charges. And you can see all the fine details from the sample structures. So one extra thing I'd like to share with you is uh, the volume scope imaging and the aerotomo is uh, compatible within the single platform, which means if you have the volume scope, you're also able to perform aerotomos on the same microscope. SEM as well. So these two methods can be combined together into the uh, one SEM. And the last approach I can share with you for large, large imaging is called the, uh, called the plasma feed, or to call it a slice and view. Because what I share with you just now, the peritomo and the volume scope give you the capabilities to look at a large volume. But the limitation is uh, uh, the resolution. If you reach really look at some much higher resolution because for the volume scope, each of the sections is around maybe 40 nanometer in the thickness. Using the multi-energy deconvolution, you can reach something close to 10 nanometer on the Z resolution. But if you want to see something even higher resolution, like I want to reach five nanometer or three nanometer, how, how, to, how can you project? We can use the size and wheel, which give you the much finer steps in each of the Z sections and also much finer imaging on both the X, Y, Z voxel. So over here, I'd like to share with you the, our Helios Hydra, which is our uh, very unique plasma, plasma feed milling platform. So this plasma feed milling is using, not only using the focus ion beam, but the source is, is the plasma, including the nitrogen, oxygen, argon, or xenon, uh, different plasmas. So the plasma is much powerful than the gallium beam, which give the capabilities to access much larger volume within uh, much finer uh, uh, G-steps. So you can see that they support, they support four different uh, plasma sources, and you can easily switch different sources uh, within a couple of minutes. And using this approach, so there is uh, no limitation about what kind of sample you can approach and how you should prepare your samples. Basically, they can adapt any sample preparations. For example, just now the, there's a one question about palm oil samples, how we can prepare the palm oil samples in resins. So I believe you need to do some ultra thin sections, then you can image for either SEM or TM imaging. So for Hydra, there's no, no need to worry about what's your sample prep methodologies. So any samples can be adapted because we have four different sorts of uh, plasma and they can adapt different uh, sample preparations and any type of resins. So over here, you can see we have a wide range of samples like tissue samples, cell culture samples, or even some very hard samples. And the sample can be prepared using chemical fixations, critical point drying, or high pressure freezing or freeze substitutions. So all different approaches uh, for sample blocks can be adapted using this uh, platform. So one, uh, one imaging platform is uh, called the LR White. So this is a very soft tissue, so not very easy to process but it has a much better preservation of the sample, samples. So this LR white can be imaged easily using uh, the, the p -feed platform. And you can see we can easily approach uh, a much larger volume as well. So if using the mirror software, you can see a reconstruction of the entire volt, uh, volume information and segmented different cellular uh, information from this workshop. And some even larger samples, for example, there is a one embryo, the entire embryo from the samples. You can, you can, you can using the focus, using the PFIP, cut this through into half. So this, this is really huge volume into maybe 500 micrometer. So this is a, 
I imagine for using some other methodologies like the focus on being, but can be approached using the plasma feed. And also you can compare the focus on MBN with the plasma feed. We can easily access something uh, around 100 micrometer in the volume. And also the, the can be reached much finer in the Z axis uh, resolution. So also, uh, if you want to reach something even larger, uh, I want to see some larger area in, into finer details, then we, there's an additional application called the spin mill. So using the spin meetings and together with the uh, plasma feed, we can reach the area like 600 micrometer, which is uh, able to visualize even with uh, naked human eyes, you can take 0.6 uh, millimeter. So with this, uh, this scale of information, we can reach something uh, like huge amount of tissues. You're also able to select a specific your regional interest at a much finer resolution. For example, we can, even though we cut this huge area, but we only focus on one tiny spot within over here, like only five micrometer. Then you can see the fine details of each of the cellular information. You can see some granules inside the cell and how the cell to cell communicate to each other. But you're also able to reach uh, finer tissues. So that's why in the previous graph I shared with you, using the uh, plasma feed, you are able to reach the balance between volume you want to achieve and the resolution you want to achieve. So it's a perfect match for both the large volume and nanomet uh, nanometer resolution from both the both sample prep and image processing. So over here, I give you a direct visitation up to the how the uh, spin mill is, can be done. You can see this entire area can be imaged using the spin meanings. And next to it is a size and view. And then you give you a direct visualization, the comparison between the volume you can reach between uh, traditional size and view and compared to the spin meaning. You can see over here, a couple of hundred micrometer can be achieved using the spin view applications. And one good example is taken from the uh, large volume, which also published uh, this year in Nature Communications is to study the high pressure freezing with, together with uh, freeze substitutions uh, to study the different neuron samples. Then they can see both the uh, large uh, volume from neurons and also able to see the synapses from the fine connectivities between different neurons. So just uh, in a quick summary, this is uh, uh, this hydro platform can reach a balance between, because of the powerful plasma feed, speed mu, they are able to reach the 3D volume into much larger volume and also uh, fine details into the, uh, in the resolution. And also, uh, just a quick quick update with you is uh, it's also similar to Aculos, which I shared with you previously. It can be used as a quail feed milling platform for your quail lamina preparations. So using the plasma feed is also able to prepare a sample in a much uh, faster, uh, faster pace. So what I shared with you previously using the Aculos, you can program maybe uh, 20 lamina overnight. So using the plasma feed, we can prepare even more lamina. Uh, overnight, which I do not have uh, exact numbers. But from the lamina, you can see the quality of your samples very, very, very precisely. You can see all the membrane structures and also some of the protein granules from your cellular tissue directly uh, using the quail uh, lamina approach. Yeah. So just now what I share with you is three different applications to visualize your samples into a large nut ball, including the uh, slice and view, uh, serial block phase imaging, we also call it volume scope, and also the array tomographies. So the basic concept is uh, similar, very similar, is cutting your samples one slice, then doing the IC image. The, the cutting can be done using the focus on MV, plasma feed, or the ultra microtome. And the microtome can be placed inside the chamber, like volume scope, or maybe uh, outside the chamber, uh, like the array tomo, and do the following imaging can be the volume scope imaging and erythromal imaging. So now let's come to the number three quiz. And while reading, I'm happy to discuss with you if you have any questions with volume imaging. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shin. It's getting more interesting to see how the technological advancement can provide the more detailed structure of our sample. Um, Bapak Ibu, silakan untuk quiz ketiga. Eh, penting belum, belum kirim linknya nah, di chat room. Untuk quiz ketiga. 
Yeah, and um, while waiting, actually, there is one question, but it's related with the procedure for TEM observation in Universitas Indonesia. So let me answer it directly, Dr. Sun. Ya, Bapak Ibu, silakan kuisnya. Uh, Linknya sudah ada di uh, chat room. Waktunya tiga menit seperti biasa. Kemudian ada satu pertanyaan dari Ibu Huyirna. Ya, dari Ibu Huyirna uh, di Fakultas Ilmu Kelautan dan Perikanan Unhas Makassar. Uh, Ibu Huyirna bertanya bahwa info time ini sangat menarik. Kami mohon info sekitarnya ada sampel kami, misalnya materi bagaimana prosedur untuk pengujian tem di lab uh, Terkait ini, Ibu nanti bisa menghubungi um, nomor ILRC ya akan diinformasikan nanti di akhir acara Bu Irna uh, juga dapat dilihat di website nanti di sana ada prosedur untuk uh, pengujian uh, bagi alat-alat yang tersedia di ILRC demikian Bu kemudian kalau terkait dengan preparasinya sendiri karena lumayan jauh ya Bu ya dari Makassar dan kita akan menggunakan tem biasanya memang sampelnya lebih aman kalau dia sudah dalam kondisi uh, embed dalam resin gitu. Jadi mungkin nanti bisa komunikasi lebih lanjut boleh dengan saya atau dengan tim dari LRT Bu Yena untuk uh, preparasi sampel sebelum dikirimkan karena supaya sampel tersebut stabil sehingga nanti uh, dilanjutkan uh, untuk tahap sectioning di lab uh, Bu. Demikian Bu Yena. Kemudian eh uh, uh, Dr. Sin, there are some questions for you. The first one is uh, What is the difference between tomography and uh, single particle analysis? This will produce three dimension images. Mm, yes, thank you very much. This is a very nice question. So in a short summary comparison, these two different approach is uh, for single particle, you are looking more for the protein structures or protein complex structure information. So it's easy to understand how the proteins uh, looks like. It's structure information like various alpha, beta sheet, various message chains, or even now with our latest setups, you are able to see each individual atoms of your protein samples. So this is a complementary methodology as compared to X-ray crystallographers and also AMR has to understand the structural information. But these are much powerful applications because they not only the structural information, but also different conformations and also different uh, uh, like uh, heterogeneities or different bending of different subunits with your structures all can be analysis using single particle approach called SPA. And the second called cryotomography is a one step further. So they are looking at, for single particle, you are looking at millions of particles uh, from your micrograph and reconstructed into 3D volume. But for tomography, you are looking at one object from the different tuning angles, and you try to reconstruct it the tooth series into 3D volume. So for tomography is more use, useful in the cellular research For example, to study your protein functions inside the cell and maybe some of the cellular components. So one good example I can share with you is to see the ATPase uh, structure and inside the mitochondria. Because inside the mitochondria, there is a lot of um, ATPase and they are in the different conformations. So using the cloud tomography, you can understand maybe within one mitochondria, where is my ATPase located? and whether what is the state, whether it's active or it's inactive, what is the confirmation information, and which step is my ATP is working. So which means using the cryotomography, tomography, you can first understand the structural information of your protein within the cell. So it gives you more close to native information from your cellular structures. And also to give you the capability to understand the cellular activities within the cell. For example, uh, like the nuclear complex, Some of these open, some is closed, some is bending with different protein complex, or maybe different tubulins or actin structures. What is uh, which protein is linked with my actin, which is a uh, uh, transport vesicle, where it is. So this really opened up the window of the cell to see what's happening inside. So there's a, a much broader application can be done using a uh, cryo tomography. So I hope I, I'll answer part of your questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sin. I think it's uh, clear uh, to to answer the question. Jadi tadi uh, perbedaan antara single particle analysis dan juga tomografi. Salah satunya kalau single particle analysis kita bisa melihat uh, protein, kemudian kita konstruk uh, 
tiga dimensinya. Sementara untuk tomografi, biasanya untuk seluler level, contohnya tadi mitokondria, kemudian ada ATPAC-nya, biasanya untuk tomografi ini kita lihat dari beberapa angle, kemudian bisa dilihat juga bagaimana tiga dimensinya dan lebih skalanya lebih besar begitu ya untuk yang tomografi. Semoga sudah terjawab beberapa penanya. Okay, so I think it's uh, over uh, three minutes. So okay. are we continue? Yes, please. So now let's see the, the quiz question for section three about the blood volume analysis. So the first question is, which of the uh, workflow is not part of the blood volume analysis? You can see it, uh, it's quite straightforward because I mentioned three different methodologies, including slice and wheel, cell block phase imaging, and erythroma. So single particle analysis is not part of the blood volume analysis. Instead, single particle to start, study the final structure information. So it's a much smaller scale compared to blood volume analysis. So the, the not included is uh, the last, last options. So the second question is, uh, which of the single party sample is not suitable for large analysis? You can see we got brain samples, neuron samples, or fish embryos. So as I mentioned previously, this is all very good samples for large analysis. But for the purified proteins, which is uh, too small to visualize for these uh, predictions, it's not suitable, but it's more suitable for the single particle or sometimes a uh, chromography applications. So both of questions, uh, the correct options is uh, uh, section D. So I hope you all choose it correctly. So Dr. Uh, Astarit, I have maybe additional 20 minutes for me. So sure, if, please. thank you. So now in the uh, in, uh, additional 20 minutes, I just share with you a uh, special sessions, uh, which I just prepared for, uh, for this talk is how we can using all different applications for to design different vaccinations to fight against the coronavirus. So all, all, all we know that the coronavirus is caused the COVID-19 pandemic all over the world and caused a lot of disasters in different places. Even in Singapore, every day we got more than 3,000 new cases every day. So people are still like locked at home and work from home. So to understand the structural information of this uh, virus, and how this virus interact with human body is critical for a successful vaccination design. So this graph I actually show you again in the single particle part. We can use the single particle to understand the structural information, like the, the, the spike proteins and its interactions with different receptors. And inside the virus is a viral genome replications and also the virus capsule surface information. It's, all this is very critical to, for a successful vaccination design. And not only this, uh, using different applications like biotomographies to understand the, how the virus replicated inside the whole cell is also very important because we can design some of the drugs to block the viral replication uh, steps or block the viral genome replications or the release of the virus from the whole cells. All different steps is critical to design a successful treatment. Like uh, previously, we have one drug target uh, the, to design the replication, to block the replication of the virus uh, ribosome genome. And this is a, uh, show some effectiveness inside the patient. So now uh, I'd like to share with you some of the different multi skills, like different approaches we can use to fight against the coronavirus. So including the first application called the single particle, I share with you the first sections to understand the structural information. And second, using Kraltomo, to understand the motions of different specs and how the specs infect the human bodies and using the structural information, how we can design different drugs and all the different treatments or vaccinations. You can see that all the different applications are very critical and come to the cover of the science magazines in, in last year. And all the different applications have been adapted by different pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer, BioNTech, Jason Jason's, so all these big pharmaceutical companies using the structural information or some other applications can be done using the vaccination design, validations, quality assessment, and some other structural information for the uh, antibody design. So now I just share with you some of the information all these pharmaceutical companies use for successful development of different vaccinations. So the, for the traditional vaccination development, uh, like the Sinovac, Sinopharm, and for the, all this from China vaccinations, and from India, we got uh, uh, Bharat Biotech, 
So all these applications is using the inactivated virus particles. So this is a very straight method, uh, straightforward method. It's very quick, uh, but requires some culturing and incubation of virus. By using the cryo-EM, we are able to understand first the virus particle information. For example, over here, using the uh, cryo-TEM, you can visualize the virus particle directly uh, to see the morphologies and also the uh, uh, surface information of the virus particle. So using the surface information to give you understanding of the, the antigens on surface particles, whether the virus is successfully inactivated or virus, uh, how many virus particles is inside my uh, inside my vaccinations. So to so the first approach is to design a very stable uh, culturing condition, for example. So one uh, application is using the nectosaline directly. So this is a vaccine designed for the food mouse disease. So previously, this vaccination is not very stable because a lot of samples are bricked, all the various particles are bricked into pieces inside the inside the buffer conditions. So straightforward using the negative staining, you can understand the distributions of the inactivated virus particles. By optimizing the, the buffer conditions, you can reach a much better distribution and intact, intact uh, virus particles inside, the, uh, inside your vaccinations. And this do not need a prior. You can easily using any of the TEM, the TEM that you have currently using the negative staining to uh, optimize your biochemistry conditions for a good vaccination design. And the second approach is using the virus vector-based vaccine. This including the Oxford, AstraZeneca, and Jason and Jason's, and also some other uh, virus from Russia and also from China, the kind of signals. So using this approach, the first thing you need a virus particle. In this example, most of it's uh, uh, AAV, the adenoviral uh, particle as a, a, a vector, as a deliverable vector. So inside the virus particle is the double strand DNA contains the structural information of your maybe the S, uh, S proteins. So this is very important to understand first whether your virus particle has loaded of your DNA successfully or not. And second, to understand the structural information to transport the virus particle inside the whole cell is also critical. Whether your virus, AAV virus able to enter the host cell without introducing additional immune response is critical for a successful vaccination design. So first is the loading of your virus particle is critical. So over here, you can see that we have two, uh, we have one cryo uh, image taken from the AAV virus. And you can see that some of them is empty and some of them is fully loaded with double strand DNA. So this is a very critical to have a, a successful vaccine dosage. If you, there are too much breakdown of your virus particles or too many empty vesicles, your vaccination is uh, not very helpful. So this is a very step uh, critical uh, quality insurance to make sure that you know, your virus particle majority is loaded with double strand DNA and able to deliver the, this uh, virus particle inside the host cells. And in addition to structural information, you have to understand the traffic of your virus particle inside the human bodies whether the surface of your virus particle introducing additional uh, immune response, whether the, your virus particle can be successfully intact, interact with your host uh, viral receptors, like an AAV receptor, and getting incorporated inside the host genome and release the double strand DNA and generate the immune response afterwards. So all this structured information is very critical for successful vaccination design. And in addition, now from uh, Moderna and Bell and Tiger and Pfizer, they're using a different approach. They're using a lipid nanoparticle containing the mRNA information because this is a much easier to production and also very easy to modify the information uh, from mRNA. But this is also critical to have different or correct uh, ISO conformation of your proteins because we all know that uh, the protein is very dynamic. It's not fixed in one uh, conformation. For example, on the spike proteins, which is uh, critical for the uh, coronavirus infections, the spike protein contains two different conformations, called pre-fusions and post-fusions, more like the one open conformation, one closed conformation. And the open conformation is critical for the infections of the virus, but not the closed conformation. 
So to, to make your vaccination successful, you need to make sure that the mRNA translated proteins is in the open conformation. Just to, so you need a very precise structural information from your mRNA to the proteins that you translated to understand what's the conformation of proteins after the mRNA translated inside whole cells. And using structural information, they identify that one important mutation called X2P mutations are able to host or maintain the MRI. Uh, this point mutation maintain your structures in the pre-fusion combinations, making the more effective vaccinations. Because if you do not know this structural information and you only just blindly transmitted the MRI inside whole cell, if your majority of the uh, vaccination generated actually in the po post-fusion combination, which is not very helpful for a successful immune response triggering. No, so the similar approach also uh, applicable for the, the recombinant protein, like the Novavax, which is widely used in America. So the recombination proteins, you also need to understand the structural information, make sure it's in the pre-fusion conform conformation and able to trigger the proper immune response inside the human body. And so over here, they show you that by triggering the S2P point mutations, the MRA translated protein are able to hold at the pre-fusion conformations. And this is important for the spike protein to interact with the ICE2 receptors, RBD, the receptor binding domain, and also important to trigger the proper immune response. So the, the EM not only limited to understand the structural information of your spike proteins from vaccinations, it also is a very good quality control to understand the, the delivery of your lipid nanoparticles. Because the lipid nanoparticle is very complex structure. You can be caught with different size, different conformation, and multiple layers. So to understand the successful loading, first to structure the, to understand the morphology of your lipid nanoparticles and the loading of your MRI inside the lipid nanoparticle is critical also for a successful uh, vaccination design. So using the quail EM, you are able to understand the morphology and like whether you are single layer or multiple layers or whether there will be a uh, more dynamic loading of different uh, components inside the lipid nanoparticle. So for example, first you are able to see the morphology using the quail EM and also the loading uh, of your deliveries. For example, by di using different concentration of the salt and the concentration of the drug, you can see the drug form different uh, crystal or maybe dispersed inside lipid nanoparticles. So this is a very critical for the pharmaceutical companies to design a suitable dosage to load inside each of the uh, nanoparticles. And what is the suitable concentrations uh, compared with your drugs, with your nanoparticles, and what's the best combinations of different concentrations for successful waste design. So using this uh, approach, we can understand morphologies loadings inside the virus, and also uh, using the MAP software together we got a particle characterization uh, uh, capabilities. They also help you uh, understanding about distributions of different size, uh, like surface area, or whether the distributions of size of particles give you some statistic understanding, which is the best uh, process I should use uh, for my sample preparations, and which is the best size of my lipid nanoparticles. So what I share with you just now is more for the 2D imaging to understand the structural information of deep nanoparticles. And also using the quail tomography, you can understand your structural information in 3D. So apply to the previous questions from the audience just now. So just now you can see the structural information from single particle approach. Now using the tomography, you can visualize the AP nanoparticle in 3D directly using the tom tomography reconstructions and imaging. And also you can reconstruct it, the tomography using the Amira softwares and visualize the, the DP nanoparticles together with the loadings of different vaccination or loadings of drugs inside the DP nanoparticles in 3D volume uh, in the, using the tomography approach. So just now we share with you is more for the vaccination designs, how we can deliver a successful vaccinations. And also the structural information is critical to design a neutralizing antibody. Uh, if you remember, I'll just give you uh, maybe another example is uh, the Trump uh, with the previous uh, uh, president from the United States who also been uh, infected from the coronavirus who has been recovered just three days after infection. 
is because he has been injected with a high dose of the uh, neutralizing antibody, and they can directly help you neutralize all the virus particles inside the bodies. So to design a successful uh, antibodies, it also requires understanding between the structural information between your antibody and the antigen from the coronavirus binding, uh, binding motif. So using the structural information from single particle approach, they can help your very successful screening of different uh, antibody candidate. You can see that is a regenerogen uh, using this approach to screening uh, different uh, antibodies from this libraries, identify potential targets from these uh, screenings to understand uh, whether this antibody is very, it's very specific to my antigen, whether there'll be some off-target uh, possibilities, and also they understand there is a binding site inside the antigens, uh, whether this binding site can be blocked by infectious or virus, safely or not. So this is, all this structural information is critical for successful neutralizing antibody screening. So just give you a quick summary. So a lot of pharmaceutical companies and the CROs companies has been adapted using the quail EM for the vaccination design. So globally, there is more than like 30 companies has been started using this approach. And even in the tech area, there's more than 11 companies using the quail EM as a facility for their vaccination design. So just now I'll give you a very brief summary about how we can use the quail EM uh, to facilitate a successful uh, vaccination design or anti neutralizing antibodies. Now let's come to the, the last quiz questions. And please see the chat, chat box for your quiz questions. And in the meantime, we can answer some of your questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sin, for sharing the insight into EM contribution on vaccine development. It's really uh, valuable for, for us, especially in this uh, condition. Okay, Bapak Ibu, uh, silakan di chat the chat room on the quiz yang terakhir this is the final quiz baik sambil menunggu apakah Bapak Ibu yang mau bertanya secara langsung kepada Dr. Sin silakan bisa raise saya so uh, in the meantime uh, Dr. Uh, Masari may I ask you what kind of vaccination has been implanted in uh, in Indonesia which vaccination you are using well, actually, uh, I'm doing observation of the chromosomes. So I use FID SAM and also cryo TM uh, thermography, but not in Indonesia because I, I observe my sample in Osaka in Ultra High Voltage uh, Center in Australia University, and uh, they have the FID SAM and also a cryo TM. So I experienced uh, preparing the samples, but yeah, still somehow I found the difficulties, especially to prepare the really thin uh, layer of the chromosome. Mm. For in Indonesia, um, in Universitas Indonesia, we have the DM, and uh, we are still uh, trying to optimize the preparation, especially in the section part. Mm. Yeah. It's difficult to prepare the, the thin layer. Yeah. Because actually, for the uh, X sections, there is a, a wide range of samples. so. Each of the sample has some unique characterizations or unique properties. So you, there's no like easy way to just one go, you can prepare everything. You, you need to fine tune it for individual samples. Right, exactly. Okay, Bapak Ibu, ada yang mau bertanya? Uh, Panitia ini yang sudah di share di chat room, sudah pertanyaan terakhir ya, Pis terakhir ya. Mas Bambang atau Mas? Yes, okay, so in this uh, last section, actually, there's only two questions posted. The first is uh, asking for Moderna and Biotech, what kind of vaccination it is. So as I shared in my talk, there will be uh, all different strategies, including the uh, inactivated virus particles, virus vectors, vaccinations, and uh, some subunits of the recombinant proteins, and also the encapsulated MRI vaccinations. For Moderna and Biotech, they are using the encapsulated MRI as a uh, uh, vaccination. So it has uh, its advantages uh, as also because it's a very fast to design different MRI, and you also you can like, do some tailor-made point mutations to make sure you transcribe a translated protein in the pre-fusion conformations. 
please uh, to understand the stroke information is also critical for successful MRI investigations. So the second uh, question is, uh, which of the steps in the vaccination design qual -EM can contribute to, including the access of the gene loading into the carrier virus, and also resolve the structure of the virus structural surface information and different confirmations for the deliveries, and also resolve the structure of the virus together with antibody, and also rapid gene to protein structural determination. So basically, qual -EM can contribute to all four uh, different approaches. So the, the right answer is number E is a uh, out of a bone. So you can see that Kalyans is a very powerful tool and contribute a lot uh, during the vaccination development, quality control, and also the uh, uh, different uh, assessment of the, like both virus particles and lipid nanoparticles uh, for the delivery of the virus. And also to contribute to the design of the uh, antibody together with the filtering and the screening of successful antibody uh, using the different uh, structural information. So I hope you're uh, getting some insights how the QLEM can help with the vaccination design. Okay, so in a quick summary, so what I share with you today is how the EM can contribute in the life science. So because life is very complex, so I try to approach it from different angles, from smallest uh, uh, structural information of proteins, come to the function of the protein inside the cell and cellular information and come to a much larger scale to understand the, uh, in, the, in the tissue level. So I show you some examples about different neurons and retina, uh, retinas inside the embryo of the uh, zebrafish eyes and combine all the information together for the multi-scale approach to understand the human life. And also using different applications with, with a multi-scale approach, uh, we can design different vaccinations for the coronavirus. So just uh, in my last slides, I share with you different tools for the multi-scale approach, including more different sample prep and different imaging platform, both TEM and SEM, and some hardware, which is important, including the energy filter and the direct electron detectors to understand the structural information or to understand the life in a better resolution. Well, thank you all for your time. And now we can discuss if you have any further questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Singh, for your very nice presentation. And you have summarized uh, all your information clearly, so I didn't need to summarize it again. And um, Bapak Ibu, now uh, the discussion, now is the discussion session. So if you have any question, apabila ada pertanyaan, silahkan dituliskan di kolom chat atau langsung raise hand. Okay, so Dr. Singh, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is from Bapak Adi. So he asked, uh, for single particle analysis, do we need spatial software to analyze the data? Oh, this is a very nice question. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. So what we, so in the single particle, so if you allow me to go back a couple of slides. So, okay, over here, you can see that we are taking the image of each of the individual proteins. Then the software can help us first picking up each of the, we call the single particle. So that's why we call the single particle. We pick up all these protein particles and align them in different orientations. Then we call the 2D class. And this 2D class will be back projected and reconstructed into the 3D product. And each of the steps require the specific softwares. So, but uh, for the academia use and research use, all the software is free to use. So what I can recommend is two softwares, called, first called Reliant, it's also a free software. And the second software is uh, called QuailSpark, it's free for the academia research use, but it will pay if you for the industry use. So both the software is very easy, straightforward. You need to have some basic understanding of your proteins. So you input the image into the software and set up some certain parameters. So the software will be done automatically for you by picking up particles. 2D classifications, 3D class uh, average, and 3D reconstructions. And finally, you get this uh, structure information from you. So later, I will maybe uh, I can type the name of your uh, the different softwares in the, in, the, in the chat box, or maybe I can prepare and send to the audience in the, uh, in the later uh, in a, by email. Okay, that's very important. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Jadi, untuk Bapak Adi, tadi betul untuk single particle analysis, kita memerlukan software. 
nanti dengan software tersebut masing-masing uh, gambarnya akan di uh, line, line gitu ya akan disejajarkan sama di back projected kemudian kita tinggal set parameter-parameternya dan nanti akan dibuat um, apa rekonstruksi tiga dimensinya seperti itu dan tadi informasi pentingnya adalah untuk akademia gratis gitu ya ada dua software yang bisa digunakan dan nanti bisa di share oleh dokter sin thank you dokter sin oke okay, so uh, move to the next question from bapak budi Uh, it's actually still related. You show many color images. Are the EM images directly, or these images are proceed using a special software? If yes, are those softwares free? Oh, okay. This is also a very nice question, <laughs> and it's a very good observation indeed. You can see that from the TEM, what we can see is only grayscale. It's only black and white. So definitely, indeed, you need the software we call the segmentations or visualization software to assign different colors to different components of your protein. So let me, if, we, if I can find uh, some examples. Uh, yeah, over here, this is a good example. You can see that this is a GABA receptor. So this GABA receptor including both the alpha subunit and beta subunit. And also to stabilize the GABA uh, receptor, there's some we call it, mega bodies around this. And also is actually there's a, a lipid nano disc uh, to around this, uh, because it's a transmembrane uh, protein. So to assign different colors, there's a different software that got a, uh, called the UCFS uh, camera. And uh, th this is a free software, you can free to use. Uh, I think there's uh, some paid software uh, like what I show you for the uh, applications, all these colors, this is, is uh, free to use for the uh, UCSS camera. But for the cryotomography, it's uh, a bit different because for cryotomo, what I share with you over here, you can see. Uh, you can see different segmentations of your like, compartment and um, like uh, Golgi's apertures and some nucleus, some other like neuron, trans, uh, neuron synapses, different information. So this Amira software is a, is a paid software, but it's a very powerful software because it's uh, uh, seamlessly connected with our Quiltomo and the large analysis workflows. So most of the time, if you acquire a TEM together or SEM for this analysis, this software will come together as a bundle deal for you. And also I believe there are also a, a free software solutions for you, but it uh, may not be very straightforward. You need to invest a little bit expert just to manage to do that manual segmentations or assign different colors. Uh, but indeed, there's a free solutions as well. Yeah, okay, thank you, Dr. Jadi tadi Bapak Budi ya. Uh, untuk TEM, memang biasanya hasil yang kita peroleh itu grayscale kan ya, seperti yang tadi ditunjukkan. Gitu. Nah, untuk membuat ini menjadi lebih colorful, lebih berwarna, terutama tadi contohnya yang juga ya, ada struktur yang apa helix, ada yang beta sheet. Nah, untuk membedakannya berbagai komponen yang ada pada um, molekul tersebut itu bisa menggunakan software dan untuk PEM ada software yang uh, free juga tadi ya. Tapi untuk Rayo uh, Tomo diperlukan uh, software khusus. Jadi yang disampaikan di sini ada Amira dan Amira ini sangat sangat ampuh gitu ya, sangat baik. Um, tapi selain Amira juga ada yang free, uh, mungkin uh, lebih terbatas gitu ya dibandingkan dengan semua terjawab Bapak Budi. Then uh, there's another question. This one is uh, related with ah, yeah, so. so do we need a particular condition to perform the life science experiments in PM, such as lower high tension or voltage, higher condition, etc. Oh, okay. So you mean which microscope condition is needed for my quality and applications? Uh, so indeed, uh, actually, let me share with you this one. Yeah. So you can see over here, uh, there's a, a different microscopes that's all suitable for different applications, including our Talos 120C, which is a 120 kV per uh, TEM, TEM platform for both suitable for both room temperature and cryo applications. And we got glaciers is our uh, 200 kV platform, and the Quios is our 300 kV platform. So there's no specific requirement for particular kV. 
But indeed, there's a rule of thumb is uh, basically the higher the QV it is, uh, the physical uh, wavelength of the electron is even shorter. So you're expecting uh, to get a bit uh, higher resolution from the high voltage. But you need to find the balance between the, uh, the cost of the microscope and also the image qualities and also the QV. So then eventually we come to the 300 QV for the ultimate structural resolution, 200 QV and 120, both is suitable for the uh, moderate uh, structural uh, resolution determination. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to confirm for the conventional PEM, it's only for the light settings. We need the lower uh, voltage or up to 200 kV is also okay. Yes, up to 200 kV, definitely no problem for that. Okay. So the for the conventional TEM, I think there's a one concern is about the contrast of your sample. Mm -hmm. So basically, the lower the kV you have, the the electron has a much stronger interactions with your sample. So you have a looks more better contrast. But also the uh, the the higher the kV, the electron has a more energy, so they can go through a, a thicker thicker sections. So basically, the the lower the kV, the better the contrast of your samples. But the higher the kV, the the thicker your sample the electron can go through. And also, the, 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 I'm sorry, sorry for interrupting. Okay, so, <laughs> okay. How about the artifact? I mean, using the, the high KV or low KV, is there any possibility for the artifact uh, formation? Oh, yes. So, for example, for the cryos, you can adjust the KV, uh, like it's a 300 KV tool, but you also can adjust the KV to 200 or even lower. But with uh, some special alignment, you can go as low as uh, 80 KV. Mm. So, it's uh, also a flexible. Mm -hmm. But to the best performance of the microscope, I will suggest you to stick to one or two KV for you. Thank you, Dr. Sin. Jadi Bapak Asep tadi yang bertanya terkait dengan uh, requirement untuk apabila kita mau mengamati uh, by digital sample itu kita bisa sesuaikan begitu ya untuk sampel kita apa. Nah di sini contohnya 200 kV itu masih bisa atau tadi bisa dengan uh, voltage yang lebih rendah sampai 80 kV biasanya untuk sampel biologi seperti itu ya. Dan uh, tadi bisa bisa diadjust tergantung uh, untuk meningkatkan kontrasnya. Kemudian tadi kalau saya bertanya Apakah mungkin bisa muncul artefak? Artefak itu jadi ada struktur di gambar uh, tem kita, tapi sebenarnya itu bukan real structure dari tem kita, gitu. Melainkan karena uh, observasi, gitu. Ternyata dengan menggunakan uh, tadi sekitar 80 kV uh, itu masih oke. Okay. Begitu Bapak Asep, and I think it's already 11:52, <laughs> so uh, we need to stop now. Thank you so much, Dr. Sin, for your really valuable information and this. Bapak-Ibu, let's give a round of applause to Dr. Sin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Sin. Dan terima kasih juga Bapak-Ibu yang sudah antusias uh, mengikuti uh, webinar ini. Saya yakin setelah ini juga Bapak-Ibu uh, tertarik untuk bisa menggunakan TM karena tadi ternyata banyak penerima Nobel Prize itu menggunakan Cryo-EM. Gitu ya. Baik, uh, saya mohon maaf apabila ada kekurangan. Sekali lagi terima kasih dan saya kembalikan kepada MC Mas Edo. Saya tutup. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Baik, terima kasih banyak Bu Astari. Selaku moderator kita pada sesi hari ini, kita beri aplausan beliau untuk beliau. Terima kasih. Baik, selanjutnya. Sebelum pengumuman dok, ah ini sudah langsung ada langsung. Kami akan mengumumkan untuk pemenang dor presesi lima hari ini, yaitu selamat kepada Nike Fitayatul Kusna, Desandra Aulia Rahmayanti, Novel Abdul Farid, dan Yusi Purwaningsi. Selamat Bapak-Ibu pemenang dor pres kita untuk hari ini. Untuk teknis klaim hadiah dor pres akan kami sampaikan. Selamat kali lagi kami ucapkan selamat kepada nama-nama berikut. Dan berikut kami sampaikan untuk tata cara klaim hadiah dor presnya. Pemenang dorpres dapat melakukan konfirmasi ke email drpm atui.ac.id dengan menyertakan nama lengkap, nomor telepon, serta alamat lengkap untuk pengiriman. Sekali juga, tak lupa kami sampaikan, apabila berkenan, Bapak dan Ibu dapat memfollow akun Instagram Risbangui, at Risbangui, dan mensubscribe YouTube kami di Direktorat Riset dan Pengembangan UI untuk mendapatkan informasi terbaru mengenai kegiatan yang kami selenggarakan. Dan juga untuk rekaman kegiatan webinar-webinar sebelumnya, Ibu da Bapak dan Ibu dapat menyaksikan kembali di kanal bit.live slash webinar Dan 
terkait informasi mengenai pengujian TEM dan alat yang kami miliki di Integrated Laboratory and Research Center Universitas Indonesia, dapat diketahui dengan nomor akses laman berikut yaitu researchuiac.id ataupun scholaruiac.id. Nanti kami juga akan menyertakan linknya di kolom chat. Dan berikutnya untuk materi webinar dan sertifikat akan kami informasikan ke peserta melalui email drpm.ui.ac.id. Baik, sekian yang dapat kami sampaikan pada hari ini. Terima kasih atas kehadiran Bapak dan Ibu sekalian untuk sesi untuk sesi TEM 5 pada hari ini. Kami dari Panitia mohon pamit undur diri. Terima kasih atas kehadiran Bapak dan Ibu sekalian dan sampai jumpa di TEM series berikutnya. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you next time. Thank you, Nising. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.